Roberts and Chris K. Not even going to try to say the last name. <laughs> Not even it. podcast. One day you'll Co- get it. Podfest Chris. That's that's what I'm going to go Chris with. Chris K is fine. Chris K. How do you say your last name? Krimitzos. Not even going to try it. Chris uh, Podfest. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say my last name? I just go Chris K. No, but if you say Krimitzos, so what does it come out with your- Well, now I know. Chris Mitzos? Oh, God. Chris Mitzos. You're going like, Chris Christmas. It's like a new st- uh, cereal or something. Yeah, that's why I just yeah. go. I already, cereal. I already know. It's like Chris <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and we have you in here, who is uh, editor of the biggest podcast, basically, magazine that there is. You were into comedy, tried UFC, all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> We're getting a little deep right out, right out of the gate, man. We're getting a little deep, but uh, but we'll bring it all together, yeah. So what happened with the UFC? So you wanted to be a UFC guy. Man, you are coming, just firing right out of the gate. Yeah. So, I mean, fighting in martial arts was always my gig. It's just everything that I loved. And, I mean, even as a kid, uh, you know, I grew up in the 80s. And I can think back all the way to, like, I don't know, 81, 82, when ninjas popped on the scene, right? And we had the ninja movies and all that good stuff. And I just, I was about 10. I was born in 72, so I was about 10 years old when ninjas hit the scene. And I just knew that if I could be a ninja, all of my little bullying problems and all my shitty stepdad problems, all that would go away if I could just kick ass. And so that was always the dream. And eventually I, I realized the dream to a certain degree and started training and started martial arts and I can still remember back in 1993 when the UFC first came to the United States. I know exactly where I was watching that first UFC. I was in my shitty little apartment. My wife had gone to buy groceries. It was raining. I mean, I remember this because it changed my life. And I watched it, and I was like, these guys suck. <laughs> these guys are pathetic because we thought we were pretty kick-ass back in the day, right? All six foot three of me and a buck 55 is <laughs> what I weighed back then, so I thought I could just whoop everybody. But it really just changed our perspective on all aspects of martial arts. I mean, as we got further into it and as we started understanding what Gracie Jiu Jitsu was, whatever this shit was that just burst onto the scene, we started realizing a lot of what we were doing obviously didn't work the way we were taught that it would work. And we just started eating it up, man. And we just loved it. And we loved every aspect of it, bought all the videos and the books. And that's how we learned. Cause I mean, I'm from North Texas and there weren't a lot of big gyms. There were no big gyms in North Texas at the time. Now there's Jiu Jitsu all over where I'm from. But back then, I mean, we're talking 95, 96. So we were, again, learning from videotapes. And we just trained our asses off. And eventually we got to where we would go to Dallas, um, I don't know, a couple times a month and train with some of the fighters down there. Uh, Back in the day, the lion's den was pretty big. Ken Shamrock and Guy Mesger and Trey Telegman and all those guys, they were in Dallas. And we, yeah, way back. And we had the opportunity to train with these guys. And I say we, it was me and my teammates. And uh, eventually, uh, Pete Spratt, he was known as the secret weapon back in the day, he actually made it to the big show he made it to his first ufc i think was ufc 37.5 it was a little offshoot that wasn't even playing they just planned it out of the blue where did uh ufc come from like when it came to america where where was it at prior well it was in brazil originally oh, oh, wow. and it wasn't the ufc it was just valley Tudo back in the day is what they called it which was basically no rules fighting and that was what was big down in in brazil like glove and did they still have gloves or no they, they did bare knuckles, bare knuckles no rules no time limits no, no nothing it was just hardcore and that's what you wanted to do i thought i did yeah <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason you know it's always for whatever reason yeah, i respect it <clears throat> but pete made it to the big show and that inspired inspired me thinking, man, I, this is my, one of my best friends at the time. And if he can be there, I can be there too. So I trained my ass off and trained my ass off and worked my way up through the, the Texas circuit and did pretty good, did real well in kickboxing. I was fairly decent at stand up, uh, but my ground game was always suspect, right? Cause I mean, we really didn't have real training on the ground back then, <laughs> but uh, I had worked my way up to a position where Pete had met a gentleman by the name of Saul Solis, who had recently passed away from COVID. But at the time, he was the top trainer in the world. I mean, he ta- he trained Tito Ortiz and Rico Rodriguez and all the champs of the UFC back then. And we went down to his gym, and I was going to fight in Homa, Louisiana uh, the next day. And um, I was rolling with a UFC fighter at the time named Eve Edwards. And rolling just basically means wrestling. And we hadn't been going for very long. I don't know, two, three, four minutes, something like that. And keep in mind that I'm starstruck, too, because I'm down here in the gym with the greatest of the greats in the world in this sport. And the god of MMA, Saul Solis, is training this session. It's just insanity for me. So he walks by and he says just a handful of words. And he goes, hey, bro, your cardio is a bit suspect. (laughs) And 
that resonated with me more so than you would ever think that it should. But it literally redirected my entire life because unbeknownst to him, and you can't make these excuses in the gym. You can't go, yeah, but uh, take this. But I was born with a birth defect. So I was born with an inverted sternum. So my sternum was concave instead of being convex, and it was growing in while all my organs were growing out. So at the age of four, I had reconstructive surgery on my sternum. Wow. And I got a scar that goes all the way down my chest, and I had some ribs that were broken and reshaped, and they broke my sternum and reshaped it. And what do you remember up, that at four? Like, do you remember the like, the like the rehab of that or anything like that? The only thing I remember, because they also put pins in to hold everything together. And I just vaguely remember, and that's almost like I remember remembering, but one of those pins, I don't know how long it was after the surgery, uh, penetrated my skin oh, and wow. woke me up in the middle oh, of the night one oh. night and had to get rushed in for that. And I remember that, but, I, I, and even that's kind of a vague memory, but I know that happened. So that memory is there to a degree. But as I grew older, um, wait, what wait, wait. It, so so your <clears throat> so that was growing out, and your organs were growing. No, my organs were growing out, just like they should, right? right? But my chest was growing in, oh, so that like my my crushing. sternum was growing towards my spine. Holy shit! And it was crushing everything. My heart couldn't beat right. My lungs couldn't expand. I couldn't breathe. That sort of thing. Wow, you're one lucky guy. Yeah, and, yeah. And I that's mean, what seventy. That's that 80. was seventy six. Okay, so yeah, because I was four. No technology. <laughs> yeah, very little. I mean, that's why it looks like shit if right. I take my shirt. You know, I I very rarely ever took my shirt off as a kid, and even as an adult. I mean, my wife and I. You know, it's like it took years for me to turn the lights on. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not that bad, but it was for a long time as a kid, especially street cred, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but uh, it's kind of funny because coming up, I I did start training at this new gym uh, before I really got hardcore into MMA. And I thought I was a fighter. And I went to this new school called America's Best. And it was in Sherman, Texas. And they had a kickboxing team. How'd that go? Not very well. (laughs) Uh, I I was a black belt at the time and thought it was going to go great. Right, because you got that big black belt. Oh, yeah. You know, I think, you know, Chris, you know, everybody's like, oh, I got a black belt. Oh, yeah. Black belt. yeah, we can all kick. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what'd you face. walk into there, Larry? Uh, I, uh, I walked yeah. into a fucking ass whooping is what I walked into. <laughs> and one of my best friends to this day, his name's Chad Witcher. I didn't know him up until that night. We, we jumped on the mat. And, uh, you know, we started training with the fight team. So this wasn't just a regular karate class. This was the fight team. And he was a heavyweight, too, by the way. So it really wasn't even fair. But whatever. He hit me with a a spin back kick, which is just a turn kick. And then he hit me right behind the ear with his heel. And he's about 240. And I'm a buck 55. And I just went, it was just a, you know, just straight face plant. So that was how that night went. But. As I learned and as I got in with these guys, I still came back the next day, you know, and I still trained and I still stuck with this and I still took my ass whoopings and I, I paid my dues. <laughs> but I learned once I got in with these guys, that that's kind of what we do, you know. And as the years progressed and I got better and better at what I thought I was already good at, we might have greenlit a few people back in the day that would come <laughs> to the gym and go, well, I want to be a fighter. Oh, do you? You do. I mean, if you think back, Dana White actually said that I'm one of the ultimate fighters. You know, yeah. do you want to be a fucking fighter? That's kind of the mentality we had back then. Do you want to be a fighter? Well, then step on the mat. Let's see what's up. But, so that's what they did to me. But I, I passed the test and they finally accepted me as one of their own. But this eventually led to this opportunity with Saul Solis. And when he said that, we kind of got on this path because we were talking about that birth defect. The one effect from that surgery was that my lungs are deformed. So my lungs ended up growing very tubularly. I think that's a word. So my lungs, if you look at an x-ray, they come up above my clavicles. Wow. And they even go down into my hip area. So they're real narrow and real squirrely looking. Um, But it left me with about 60% lung capacity. What a hell of a surgeon that was. Right? I mean, the fact that I'm even here, I turned 50 in six weeks. I turned 50 August 30th. And the fact that I've made it this far, that is a gift in and of itself. Yeah, Yeah. it's insane. It's insane. no other word. That's miracle shit. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, and I think his name was Dr. Falahi was his name. I doubt he's alive anymore, but whatever. If he he was, is, send him a fucking box of cookies yeah, right, or something, right? right? <laughs> or or fucking you, start arguing, send him some fucking <laughs> books or some shit. Send him something, Fuck. right, David? Invite him to your podcast. So, hey, man, you want to be on a podcast? Yeah. 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 Take him out for dinner. Thank yeah. Yeah. Give him yeah. a golf club or something. <laughs> or buy him a golf cart. He's probably rolling something. around in his development in his golf cart. I would imagine. I would imagine. Because <laughs> obviously he was a miracle worker even then. So, um, But again, it left me with you know limited lung capacity. And when Saul walked by and said that, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt with just those few words 
that my life was forever changed. Game over. Because I know now that while I did fair on the regional circuit, whatever, um, I'm stepping up in competition. Now I'm fighting athletes, real athletes, that are also very, very skilled. And I'm not going to, this isn't going to work. This is not going to work. I think you're insane to even do that, given you had that surgery. Well, I mean, I, you're, you're taking kicks. You're taking bare hand yeah, punches yeah. After, after you have like a surgery that is probably the odds of that working is probably half a percent. I, I don't know what the percentage is, but <laughs> yeah, high, it, it, it was very low. And it, it, it actually led to some interesting d developments across my life yeah. because I ended up being very, very coddled as a child. And there's some irony there, but um, I ended up being put into private school for protection. My grandmother stepped in, and although we were not well-to-do at all, I grew up in a trailer park, um, but grandma paid the balance for me to go to private school literally all through high school. So it, that got, I mean, life is so just weird because growing up in a trailer park, but going to the most expensive private school in Grayson County. It's like, uh, what the fuck? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to hang out with the cool kids that are, you know, wearing the but Jordan. But you can't invite them over. No, don't come yeah, to my house. Yeah, yeah, you can't come to my crib for real. So, I mean. So Larry, I have a question. Yeah. Do you regret not going into that fight? Oh, well, we didn't even get to that yet. But yes, very much so. So what I ended up, yeah, let's just stay on that storyline. So I ended up backing out of that fight. Uh, I ended up getting sick. And I pulled out, I think I pulled out the day of. We went to the venue and we did weigh-ins and just this whole time, just Saul saying that to me, just, just it really just destroyed me. And that kind of talks to my limited mental capacity at the time or my lack of mental strengthness at the time, uh, strengthness at the time as well. But I pulled out and said I was sick. Now I wasn't too sick because Pete Spratt was also fighting on the same card, and he was fighting for a world title at the organization. I wasn't too sick to corner him, oh. so I'm sitting there working his corner and screaming, telling him exactly what to do during the fight. But I was too sick to compete. <laughs> well, you're you're done anyway, so you might as well go out with a bang. <laughs> I guess so. Whatever, who cares? But, this, uh... You know, and the real shitty part though is too is that I went back to work the next day and told everybody I won because I was too embarrassed that I backed out. Yeah. And uh, this, I mean, this telling this story on this show is probably the biggest proclamation of that story because I don't think I've ever shared that on my own podcast uh, because I just don't tell it. I mean, well, it's thank you. It's pretty embarrassing to go, you no, know. I, I yeah. think it's very man of you to to say that. And look, it's not like you backed out; you're fucked up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> well, it, yeah. It's just it was just one of those situations, and but you stuck with it, and and tons of respect for sticking with it and even well, attempting it with with the, the the situations you had against it yeah yeah and i think that's why though because you know it was i was coddled and i was picked on for being tall and skinny and very narrow and bird legs and this and that and all this kind of shit and i was never allowed to play sports so i didn't grow up athletic at all never had the opportunity really uh, I finally got to play some high school sports my junior year of high school. But this was your way to get back at the the kids that might have messed everybody. Right? Yeah, everybody. You know, I'm a black belt now. You know, yeah. come to my gym and we can talk about come it. On, you know, come that, on, buddy. Right. That was it, 100. percent So, but that was why things changed, and I realized that I was never going to make it to the big show, even though a lot of my friends did back in the day, and uh, that was a, a life changer. Did you watch UFC? I did. I have a question. I'm glad you brought it up. Hoist Gracie, remember the of first course. couple? Of course. Don't you think he was cheating when he would take his clothes and choke people out with the gi? <laughs> he wasn't cheating. There were no rules in those. I mean, come on. Like, I could take a rope and put it around your neck and just hang on the back side of it. <laughs> oh, you could do that kind of shit back then? Oh, yeah. He would, yeah. Take, his, he would yeah. take his gi. So let's God, say now the, you get 20 years if you yeah. did that. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy, the other guy has no shirt. He'd figure out how to get his gi around and he'd choke you out with it, right? Can I, can it, I get a conspiracy charge for talking like this? No, no, you're fine. You're fine. It was, it was the rules. At the time, but it he horrible. did that for how that was like the first five seasons or whatever. Well, there weren't seasons back then, but it was whatever the first, you call it, the first yeah, five shows. It was the first several years before you know Dana White owns the UFC now. They took over at UFC 33. So up until UFC 32, they had started implementing rules. I'm gonna say I don't. I used to know this right right off the top of my head, but I'm gonna say in the mid teens, like UFC. 13, 14, somewhere in that neighborhood, they started trying to implement rules. Uh, UFC 6 was the first time we ever saw gloves, and they were very wow. similar to the gloves that we see now, the fingerless-type gloves. Uh, but they were um, they were bag gloves back then, you know, for working out, just working the bag. And I believe Tank Abbott was the first Tank, one. Tank, I was just going to say. Him. Yeah, yeah. Okay, he was, was the animal. man. <laughs> I, I think Tank was the first one to ever wear gloves in the octagon. And, you know, they did it more so to protect their hands than, of course, to protect the person that they're hitting because they're, they're only four-ounce gloves. I mean, that's that's not a lot of protection, you know, especially for Is there a difference, though, from bare hand to four ounce? Is there like a difference? 
there is there's definitely a difference. It hurts it's, less, right? It, it doesn't hurt less. The impact yeah, is, the is impact? just different. And it also, although if you watch some of the UFC now, you'll see a lot of cuts and you'll see a lot of blood, but a lot of the cuts now don't necessarily, they, they do come from punches, but the gloves more so cut down on the cuts. Uh, that's kind of a weird way to say it. It reduces the number of cuts from punches. So that's really what that's for, and to provide the hand, some protection for the hands, because the fighters, when you're bare knuckle, you have a much higher chance of fracturing your hand than you do with some sort of protection. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So it's not so much to lessen the impact of the shots as it is to provide protection for the fighters themselves. I think it's wild. They're, they're doing bare knuckle now. It's their yeah. Bobby Chez is doing it. Yeah, they're now you've got bare knuckle boxing, yeah. which I, I didn't think that was going to take off, but it has gotten huge. Uh, he started it. He did it. He said he was remember Bob, yeah. but he uh, he fought Holyfield, and then he fought he fought Holyfield. Holyfield put the hot sauce on his gloves, got in Bobby Chez's eye. Yeah, and then he fought, but he had to beat Chez to fight Tyson. Then when he did the hot sauce shit with Tyson, Tyson bit fucking two pieces of his ear off. Yeah, yeah. This episode is sponsored by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels are dropping substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Low testosterone can have all type of health effects. It can affect your muscle mass, memory, mood, sex drive, you name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. They're a worldwide leader in at-home testing kits, and their male hormone test lets you easily test your testosterone levels at home. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next-day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available to you in your secure online account within two to five days. These results are reviewed by a clinician, and a member of Let's Get Checked nursing team may call you to review your results. Let's Get Check Laboratories are CLIA approved and CAP accredited, which is the highest ranking levels of accreditation. So, if you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS. Special offer for MSCS media viewers. Use promo code MSCS at checkout and get 30% off your test. The link is in the description below at the top. This episode is brought to you by Fiji. More than just water. This is not just rock. It's ancient volcanic rock that filters tropical rain, giving it double the electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water. It's Fiji water. Again, that's FijiWater.com slash MSCS, $5 off and free shipping. That's why I bit the ear off, uh, because of the hot sauce. I didn't sauce. know that. Yeah. See, you, you don't hear that part of the story ever. Right. Yeah. That That's that's what happened. with that, that's. I didn't know he bit two pieces off. I, don't, I thought he only got one, but I guess he went back for seconds. So, and Bobby Chez was uh, the Showtime announcer at the time. So he was a boxer and Showtime announcer. So then he was the announcer for that fight with Holyfield and Tyson. So as a boxer, he saw the two bites. Then when Tyson had to go to court, Bobby Chess testified in Tyson's defense that Holyfield was using hot sauce on his gloves and pro proved that he was blind and uh, practically blind in one eye. When he was in here, he couldn't read the menu. Really? Yeah, I had to read it to him. Wow. Yeah, crazy, right? Yeah, that is crazy. So then you, you get out of that UFC. Yeah. Right? Did you know the difference between MMA and UFC? Because you, you were watching it. Yeah, I was watching, but isn't it the same thing? I had the champion of the M M M A N. Uh what's his name? Mario. It's martial arts. Yeah. yeah. And he and the way he explained it to me was it's the same thing, but UFC's branded more basically branded. Well, they're they're essentially oh, the it's same. The league, right, right. Yeah, the I UFC know. is a brand now. Was he BJJ? I mean, was he a BJJ though? Was he a Marcelo? Marcelo? Marcelo Garcia? Was it Marcelo? No, I'm talking about Mario. Uh, we had another one in Marcel. Okay. Yeah, no, no. He was just saying the difference between MMA and UFC. Yeah, it's like NASCAR. You say racing. NASCAR is the brand. UFC is the brand. Then you got yeah, Bellator. Yeah, hundred percent. UFC is just the brand. I Same mean, thing though. They they brought it. The original UFC, Art Davies and the guys back in the day, they brought it to the United States along with uh, it was Horry and Gracie, and Art Davies brought the show to the states in I think it was November of ninety three. And it eventually got bought out by Dana White, and they took and they rebranded it and completely changed. They the didn't face have of weight classes in the first years, in right? The, in the first few years, there were no weight classes. Wow. The the Hoist Gracie guy, remember, he was like one eighty against yeah, he's like three hundred yeah. pounder. He was like one seventy six. I mean, against the three hundred, the yeah. guy almost killed him, even though he choked <laughs> oh, yeah. him out with the gi. Yeah, the guy almost killed him before. Like after he was done with the match, the guy couldn't right. He couldn't well, walk he, off. I think you're I think you're thinking of UFC four. Yeah, <clears throat> where he fought Kimo Leopoldo. 
and he, him and Chemo fought oh for God, I'm going to say 12, 14 minutes. I used to watch it as a little kid. Yeah, 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 and it was it was an amazing fight. But that was the first time we ever saw Hoist tested was against Chemo, and it's because he was just a massive dude, and he was you know young and strong and had a little bit of skill behind him as well, not near the skill that Hoist had. So Hoist ended up winning that fight, but he had to pull out from the rest of the tournament. He couldn't continue, so he won the fight, but did not win that that because uh, the guy was a hundred pounds heavier. So. Yeah, it was, and I think right. it was, you imagine the guy crushed him even though he won the fight. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. that's crazy. So it's, sometimes uh, you got to sit back and you go, you won the fight really you won i mean you do you do you win but at the same time i mean how much of an ass whooping do you have to take and you, to win you, you, and still to say win. That you, won. you still yeah. watch it now i watch every now and then who do you think's the best right now oh i wouldn't that, that would be his domain i don't know i like i'm of the like the guys that make the headlines right now i like jake paul challenging mcgregor <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i like the social even, media stuff jake paul's not even in the u.s i know that's what i'm telling you i don't watch it like that Who who's the one fighting tyson I always mix them up. Lo uh, Logan's fighting. Well, I think he's supposed. They haven't nah, signed I, off on it yet. No, nah, Chess said he's fighting. It was Logan? No, nah, he's fighting them. Is he? Well, yeah, Lo Logan. Logan just signed with the WWE. Yeah. So I don't think he's fighting anymore at all because he's only he's Maybe like zero and Jake. one or zero and two. He's is he's, yeah, he's got a shitty record. Jake's the, undefe Jake's the undefeated one. Yeah, Jake, he's fighting yeah. Jake. the young one. Yeah, yeah, he wants Tyson's to fight McGregor. Fighting. Tyson's fighting Jake. The young one. Yeah. One of the Logans. They're smart. Well, right. Jake's fighting on the 11th, yeah. and he's fighting his first real legitimate boxer. And the guy's like 15 and one. He's just coming off of his first loss. The guy got knocked out in his last fight. So this is gonna be interesting to see if if he can really fight. Uh, I mean, because Jake's made his name fighting people that are either way past their prime or really not even strikers at all. So you, you think know? McGregor's the best or Jones? Well, Jones is by far no if ends yeah, or buts about now, it. Yeah, but that guy was using steroids. No, 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 no. no. That no, 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 you don't no, think no, so? no, no. No, no, I know so. And I know the guy that sold it to him. What happened was, and the guy is indicted. He, he, he got 24 months or something. The guy that sold it to him, what he did was he didn't clean the tray. So the guy that sold it to him was making Viagra, uh, anti-estrogens, peptides, steroids, whatever you want to, what, everything under the moon. When he did it, he didn't clean the tray. So then when he went to make the Viagra for Jim Jones is, is what he got. There was, uh, you know, traces of letrozole that got into the. And that's Viagra. why there was small <laughs> pixels. And that and letrozole is an anti-estrogen, and the only reason anyone on the planet would ever take letrozole is if they're on steroids. So they ba they banned him based on those trace amounts of the letrozole, but he wasn't on juice. He was on Viagra. Interesting. That's what it was. There you go. Yeah, and I, mean, I and I know the guy personally. Who sold this, it that's an exclusive. That's yeah. a big, I mean, that, that's, yeah, no, that's, that, that's big. The only thing with John Jones is, is that the he, other shit he does, I don't know. Yeah, the other <laughs> shit, he, he, he does a lot of other shit that gets him uh, I don't in, want no in problems, hot water. Brother. Yeah, I don't either. I don't want him coming <laughs> after me. But fuck no. Some of his other issues uh, tend to, to set him back. But he's coming back. He should be back potentially the end of this year. Really? Uh, but maybe early next year. So he's back. He's ready. But he's coming back at heavyweight, oh, and yeah. they're, they're trying to get him in there with Ngano. So, he's like 250 uh, right now. Yeah, he's huge. He is he's freaking huge. Fucking huge. So it's going to be amazing to see him come and, and see, see if he's got that quickness. I mean, I'm sure it slowed him down a little bit, but I mean, his entire family is athletic. I mean, his, both his brothers are in the NFL. I mean, he's just the baby of the bunch. Right, but right. It, I'll get off the UFC thing. But yeah. the, the last thing, <laughs> you ever see his his legs? Who, John Jones? Yeah. He, he has pencil legs. Dude, yeah. his calves are his, yeah. they're, they're, they're like yeah. wrists. Which is so odd, right? Yeah. For a UFC fighter. Well, it's really not that odd because if you no. look, there's been some really tragic accidents of, and they're not often. I think I can I can only think of two, maybe three, where somebody throws a kick and it the breaks their, their tibia and fibia. Or, that's the bottom ones, right? <laughs> yeah, but McGregor, yeah. remember McGregor broke his when he uh, yeah, kicked, yeah. Uh, kicked out. Yeah, I mean, that just happened to McGregor. Okay, so that's three because Chris Weidman's done it, Andr uh, Anderson Silva did Silva. it, and M McGregor's done it now. So that's the three that come to me off the top of my head. And it's surprising to me that John Jones hasn't suffered a similar injury because they are – he's got this massive upper body and these little bitty calves. So so maybe it benefits him. Whatever, yeah. it works you think for him. McGregor's 100%? You think he comes no, I don't back? Think, I don't think he's ever 100. percent He'll come back, but I, he, he's never going to be where he was. No way. He's too busy partying and too living busy the big. Partying. Yeah, he and, and, and he was walking around with a cane after a month. Yeah, you, know, you, you got to let that heal. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So the UFC doesn't work, and is that when you turn to alcohol? Yeah. Is that when alcohol becomes yeah. an issue? Yeah. It well, I mean, it took several years from that point, but yeah, I I, I switched everything up. I had no idea what what I'm what am I going to do now? Because you're lost now. Because right? that was life, dude. I mean, that was life. I lived at the gym. I trained every day, all day. At one point, I mean, all I did was teach cardio kickboxing. 
I had five gyms in Grayson County, and then I'd go to the karate school at night, teach all the classes at the karate school. Then at nine o'clock, so the fight like, team comes like, in, and we train. Just like everything, everything's just been drained out of you. And, and now, and now I don't have shit. Now you go sit on the couch, and how long are you drinking for? Uh, from about two thousand ish, right there in that neighborhood, up until I went into rehab at the end of twenty thirteen, November fourteenth of twenty thirteen, is when I ended up in rehab. So when you went and into the comedy lane, which was interesting to go from UFC to comedy, yeah, you're drinking during the comedy, right? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I mean, it, that, that too. That. Between fighting and comedy, those were my two escapes as a kid. Yeah. You know, I loved Dice. I loved. Uh, I mean, Sam Kinison yeah, by Dice time. Guy. My all-time favorite comedian is Sam Kinison. I mean, he was, although he was short-lived, I mean, when he was here with us, he was amazing. And to this day, he still cracks me up. I still love his shit. But uh, just having that influence and not having, you know, a, a fight career, comedy was like the next best thing to me. So, you, so. so you're done with the UFC. Now you're drinking. How do you get off the couch when, when you're, you know, drinking to yeah. go do comedy, to write? Do lines, all that other stuff. I, I, well, for one, I was just an open micer. I suck shit. So, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> you saw? <laughs> no, I said still. Oh, I thought yeah. you said. I thought you said. Oh, I, I saw. I was like, oh, there's a couple of videos out there, but. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the 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 real effort to do comedy came after I got sober. So I, I went into rehab November fourteenth of twenty thirteen. And... Well, what well, well, what was it that happened that made you want to get sober? Well, like when well, was it? Like yeah, you say twenty thirteen. Yeah. Right, you're drinking all the way till thirteen. It, what what was the light that popped? Because you know rehab works for some, doesn't right, work for others. Right. You know what was it? And it's it's funny because this morning I was in a clubhouse room and they were talking about telling your story, and uh, someone said that you know I, I don't want to tell my story because it's a rehab story and people have heard it a million times. And someone else goes, well, your your story is different, even though it's a rehab story. Your story is different because it's yours. And then somebody else comes in and goes, no, fuck that. That's not true. It, we've all heard the same shit. There's just some minor differences. Well, I'm still arrogant enough to say that my story is different. So, uh, I, <laughs> sorry. Um, but that year, 13, was just a, a mother. I mean, it was it was terrible. I went in the hospital in July of 13 for you alcohol had, uh, poisoning. Alcohol poisoning. Right? Yeah. And How I did much about, alcohol did it take to get yeah. alcohol poisoning? Dude, here, here's, here's what my world looked like for that year was it was so bad that before I even got to where I was drinking 24 seven, I would go into detox during the day while at work, start sweating profusely. I mean, just straight up deets. And I would get home, go straight to the freezer because my drink of choice was gin Ooh. because it all started because I used to enjoy the taste of, and I, I probably still would love it, uh, Bombay Sapphire gin on the rocks. That was my drink. And I love to just sit and sip. I mean, it was just whatever. It was cool. And I love the taste of it. People go, ah, fuck, that's disgusting. But it's great. Whatever. Fuck you. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I got a little aggressive. Uh, edit that out if you want to. But, fuck that. Uh, fuck that. <laughs> that's a highlight clip. What are you talking yeah. about? The man loves his fucking gin. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I love some Bombay Sapphire. You got, you got a fucking problem, so what? Uh, Look, yeah, I might you... be sober, but you can still sponsor me if you want to. So um, I won't turn it down. So anyways. He's, that, he's that, definitely that, unique. Look at his surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got the scar. Been around for a day or two, so, um, but that kind of it gets it gets expensive when you start shooting gin, right? So I, <laughs> I was like, "Fuck, I got to downplay this a little bit." So I, I moved to Seagrams so I could afford to shoot the shit. So what do you mean uh, shoot the stuff? Like shoot it, like do shooter, oh, do, shots. Yeah, shots. do shots, do shots. You were you were sorry. thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. enema up your ass. No, 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 no. Oh. I didn't. Get, I didn't, never got that that bad. So well, you would have saved a lot of money. I probably yeah. would have. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I anyway. So it was so. <laughs> Bad, you though, could have that, been hammered for the day up the ass, bro. Uh, maybe like, probably like two bucks. Yeah, no. I'll keep that in mind if I ever relapse. Yeah, if so, you ever relapse, I would just go was, with the Vlad Mir, pull up like one ml <laughs> in the ass. You don't even need the straight flax. to it. Straight you're good, to you're it. You're good it's till six from p.m., Dr. bro. Tommy, I love it. <laughs> and then you keep another pin, you know, just to spray up. There yeah, in just case, in case. In case just, you start getting the chills, bang. There Let's you go. go. Yeah, yeah. This podcast is brought to you by Monster Energy. Tear into a can of the meanest energy drink on the planet, Monster Energy. It's the ideal combo of the right ingredients in the right proportion to deliver a big bad buzz that only Monster can. Monster packs a powerful punch, has a smooth, easy drinking flavor. Athletes, musicians, co-eds, road warriors, metalheads, geeks, hipsters, and bikers dig it. You will too. Monster Energy is more than just the green OG. Monster has Monster Ultra, Juice Monster, Monster Hydro, Rehab Monster, Dragon Tea, Monster Max, Muscle Monster, and many more. Buy on Amazon, buy on Walmart, 
or go to monsterenergy.com and believe me, you'll find a place. Unleash the beast. Monster Energy. This podcast is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Go to www.expressvpn.com, use code MSCS, and get 20% off your order. VPN is a power tool for your devices that enhances the internet. With it, you can do three really cool things. One, watch movies and TV from any of your devices fast and securely. Two, you can use parts of the internet that are blocked in certain countries. Three, you can keep your internet traffic private even when you're on an unsecured public network. That's www.expressvpn.com. Use the code MSCS at checkout and get 20% off your order. I'm ready again. <laughs> Shit, I never thought of that. So, so, so got to think these things through when we're in these situations. I'm thankful I didn't think of that because <laughs> odds are I probably would have tried that shit. So save money. Uh, <laughs> too late now. <laughs> but I had moved to Seagram. So what I would do is I'd get home from work. I'd go straight to the freezer. I mean, nothing else. Wouldn't let the dogs out or nothing. Just straight <laughs> to the freezer, and I'd pour a shot. And I would literally stand over the sink in the kitchen because I knew the first shot was coming back up. That's how fucked up I was. I knew the first shot wasn't staying down. So I'd do the shot. I'd stand there for about 10 seconds, and then bleh, there it goes. I'd do the second one. Most of the time, the second one would stay down. But generally, it wasn't until that third, fourth, fifth shot before I was like, oh, God, okay, cool. And people go, how many shots a night did you do? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Um, at one point, I went to my just my regular GP doctor in an effort to try to get sober again. And he goes, well, do this for me. Get a whiteboard and just keep track of how many shots you're doing. Huh. And, and yeah. yeah. And then he's like, every night, just do one less. And I'm like, man, by, by five or six, I don't give a shit. I'm not yeah. going to sit here and do hash marks on a whiteboard. Who does that? Like, like, how, how high did you get up on the hash? I, I, I never even tried it I because be it's like, such a ridiculous idea. I'm like, Doc, I drink liquor yeah. all day long. Do you think I'm going to remember yeah. to write on the whiteboard, yeah. you, you fucking yeah. moron? How the <laughs> fuck are you a doctor? He was a yeah. <laughs> hey, alcoholic who's yeah. drinking 24, that white, put a Just whiteboard up. Just look at the up. amount of bottles that are and finished. That's what you could probably do. Get, I finished get, two get bottles. the black that, marker and write, I took a shot today. Oh, yeah, I'm just, sure you're going to get off the fucking oh, couch many, with your Seagrams and go do that. How, yeah. many, how many empty bottles are left? That's what I'd be like. How many empty bottles are two? We, we would do, we would, we would get up to, at the worst point, we were we would go through about a 750 a night. Yeah. So of, of what of of Seagram's gin? Jeez. Yeah, a, a, a night. That's half a gallon, right? I don't know. I, it's like a quarter gallon or something. What is, what is uh, so? I have suck at math. So. I, mean, I don't know. We call yeah, it. A, that's a lot. Can you Google yeah. that? Yeah. What what is it? What is seven fifty? Because a fifth, I think, is five hundred. Yeah, right? a fifth's nothing. I mean, that's cake. I mean, a fifth was just like enough to get you going. You know, you know. But the seven fifty is the handle. You know, you can grab. Oh, another. you had the handle. Yeah, oh, the okay. handle. I'm so, I got you. Um, so yeah, I was going through, I mean, I, I was spending thousands a month on alcohol cause I was also, I was buying cold beer too, cause that's what we call it in Texas, cold beer. You can't just have beer. You gotta have cold beer. So <laughs> <laughs> we'd buy cold beer too, but we wouldn't drink the beer. You know, it was just, the, what, do you, what just, do you guys drink in Texas? Bud? It's gotta be. Bud. Uh, I was, Miller. I was a Miller Lite kind of guy. Miller Lite. Yeah, yeah. All right. I got yeah. it my second. Yeah. Guess. What'd so. you say, Rob? It doesn't say 750 liters is 1.98. Liquid gallons. See, I'm, I'm terrible. Well, it's, a, it's a milliliter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's we didn't it's really, we're not doing the SAT today. So, yeah. okay. so. <laughs> but uh, so that's kind of how it. That that was one of the worst points. But then it, it got even beyond that because I, I got to where I would wake up in the middle of the night after passing out, and I'd wake up in the backyard. I'd wake up in the game room. I'd wake up on. The, I'd wake up wherever the fuck I fell asleep. You know, or passed out. And in order to get back to sleep, I'd do two or three more shots. So two or three o'clock in the morning, I get up, do two, three, four more shots, pass back out. Uh, I'd get up the next day, and I knew there was a point in that year where I knew that I wasn't going to make it through the day without going through deets, right? So I would wait for my wife to turn on the hairdryer so that she couldn't hear me get in the freezer. So as soon as she turned on the hairdryer, I'd get in the freezer, and I'd slam back two or three shots to get me going for the day. And it got to the point where that yeah. wasn't enough either. Yeah. So I'd go, you know what? I can't go to lunch with the guys today. I got to go home for this reason or that. And I'd go home at lunch and I'd do two or three, four more shots. And that would get me through the day. And that was that one night, though, in July of 2013, where I don't know what point I reached, but it felt like my body was on fire. It just literally felt like from head to toe, I was on fire. And it wouldn't stop. And my wife called the ambulance. They scooped me up and uh, ended up in the hospital. I think I was there for about three or four days while they rehydrated me. And 
it, uh, the the company that I worked for at the time, they were amazing, amazing. And they were, I was there 21 years. I just left last year. They stuck with me through all this bullshit, all the alcoholism, all the nonsense that I pulled. They supported me the whole way. So kudos to them. I, I re- yeah. appreciate it, respect them more than they'll ever know. Um, so I ended up going back to the office and the VP of our department pulls me in. He goes, look, I know we're playing like you're sick, but you and I both know what's up. And uh, if it happens again, you can either pack your shit or you can get help. And he's a close personal friend of mine as well, kind of a father figure type kind of guy that just has always taken care of me ever since I've known him. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal guy. And I promised him, oh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm sober. I'm not doing anything. I'll take a breathalyzer every day. I'll do whatever. And uh, I did. I sobered up for about two months. And I don't know what triggered it because, in, in all honesty, my wife, she drank pretty much as much as I did. She didn't do the middle of the night bullshit or the lunch bullshit or the morning bullshit, but she would party the night before. And so we would both drink together. And we had tried multiple times through the years going, look, we drink too much. We need to cut this shit out. And either I'd be ready to quit and she wasn't, or she'd be ready to quit and I wasn't, or we're both ready to quit. And we're good for about two days, but we also worked together. We worked at the same company. So we both would, something had happened at the office and we're driving home. We're like, like, oh, you're like, hey, honey, you, did you bring the flask? Yeah, and this day like, fucking hey, sucks. Hey, well, you got a flask and you're like, fuck. Yep, yep, 100%, <laughs> dude. We're like, I tell you what, let's just go get a small bottle. We'll just get a small bottle. Yeah, at your lunch break, you go. Yes, right? it, dude. Yes. I went yesterday. <laughs> we, Dude, Tommy, it got so bad that we would switch liquor stores <laughs> because we were going to the liquor store so much that we were embarrassed to go back. So we had we had a, a circle of liquor stores. We'd hit this one and then this one and this, so that we weren't frequenting it as much. When my mom died, I got bombed for a month. I got embarrassed to go back to the same gas station. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had pinpointed what gas stations I hadn't gone through yet. Yeah, it's nuts. And you know you got a problem when you're doing yeah, that, right? Yeah. That, that might I'm, be a flag. When I'm looking at a map, all right, I've been to that one. Yep. You're out of my shit. Yep, yep. <laughs> And that's exactly month, how like it that. was. Yeah. So we were good for a couple of months, but of course something happened at the office. And we go, let's just go get a small bottle. <laughs> and then the small bottle evolved into a handle and then a handle, two handles, and it just got back into it. But this time, I don't know what clicked mentally, but I was just like, fuck it. I'm done, dude. I'm just done. So I just went even harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. And it got to the point where about two weeks before I ended up in rehab, I'd stopped going to work, stopped going into the office, made every excuse in the book. They knew what was going on. They weren't fucking stupid, right? But they were sticking with me. Why? I don't know, but they were. And uh, after about two weeks of not eating, not doing anything, I was drinking those uh, Special K pre-mix break- breakfast shakes. So I'm doing gin and chocolate breakfast oh, shakes. Oh, fuck. God, talk, talk about a fuck. fun experience there. So, uh, yeah, I was a little less than clean most of the time. But um, I was sitting there, and here's the weird thing. and this is I, don't, I understand. I don't, I don't tell this part to too many people. Um, I was watching two movies, and I watched them over and over and over again. And this sounds so cheesy, but I was watching the original Superman with Christopher Reeve and uh, 1978 Superman. And at one point of that movie, Lois Lane dies. I don't know if you remember, but he's supposed to save the world and there's two nuclear bombs going off and he can't. He promised Lex Luthor he'd save his mom before, no, whatever her name was, Lex Luthor's honey or whatever, whatever. But he doesn't get to Lois Lane in time and she dies. And... Superman gets there, realizes that she's dead, and he picks her up out of this. She, she got buried alive, and he picks her up out of the dirt, and her head just kind of falls to the side, and he lets out this little whimper. This little, like, oh, yeah, it sounds so, it, it sounds so fucking cheesy, okay? I promise. Yeah. But it just, and then he would see that she's dead, and that he couldn't get there in time, and he feels like a fucking failure, and he flies off into the clouds, and he lets out this just painful roar. And then he ends up flying around the world backwards and everything is fixed. But I would watch that scene where she dies and he flies into the clouds and screams at the top of his lungs. I don't know if that meant that I was hurting or whatever, but I watched it hundreds of times over the span of several days. I'd watch that and then I watched the Batman with Christian Bale where he fought Bane and Bane breaks oh, his yeah. back. Very and, good one. Yeah. One. And so I watched that fight scene with Batman and Bane and, and Batman getting his ass kicked and Superman basically getting his ass kicked by letting his woman die. And I watched them hundreds. And my wife won't even let me watch either one of the movies now. She's like, we're never, <laughs> ever watching those again. So I just sat there in this self pity, this, just this, what I've, uh, I've, I've deemed it pity porn. And I just, I just, I just sucked it up. Like I was like, like regular porn. Just, I, I was an addi- I addicted to this pity porn and I was sitting there just watching it and watching it and watching it. And eventually 
like that last day, well, November 13th uh, or November 14th, I always get the, the day and the, the, the years transcribed because it's 14 and 13. But anyways, uh, I had a voice, dude, and this sounds so fucking cheesy, and I know it sounds cheesy, but it was an epiphany, a moment of clarity, whatever the fuck you want to call it, and it literally just said, if you don't get help today, tomorrow's not happening. It was literally like just a voice from heaven. That's not fucking cheesy. That's called fucking instinct. It was, and you listen to your instinct. It was so clear, bro. It was, it was, it was. People who call that cheesy are stupid people. Well, I appreciate it's called instinct. That. And I, I had that realization, and I picked up the phone. I don't know how, because you're like, well, you've been drinking all this time. You're not sober. Fuck, I don't know how to explain it. But I managed to pick up the phone, and I called my boy Kenny, and I said, Kenny, I need help. I'm about to die. And Kenny also worked at the same place my wife and I worked. He went over to her desk, got her. They went over to the, the father figure gentleman that I mentioned earlier and said, Larry just called. He needs help. And this was another just everything falling into place. He happened to live next door to the son of one of the more prominent recovery doctors in Texas that is a co-owner of one of the most prominent facilities in Texas. And before you know it, three or four hours later, they take me off to the facility. And uh, it was called Inner Health. Uh, they have offices in Dallas, but they have a ranch out in Van Austin. So if anybody's listening to this and you're from Texas and you need help, they did a phenomenal job with me. So it was it was amazing. Um, but I got there and I was so far gone, they couldn't stabilize me. My vitals were fucked. And so they had to call an ambulance. So here's the new guy at the, at the rehab spot. And they're like, fuck this, we can't help this dude. So they called the ambulance, rushed me back to the hospital, spent another three or four days in the hospital. Finally got stabilized there. Rehab came and got me, took me back there and did six weeks of, of therapy. Um, and I was supposed to go home. But my wife came and got me, and we went and had lunch, and it was kind of weird to get acclimated back to— it was real weird, not kind of. It was real fucking weird to get acclimated back to society and be around people sober. and be sober. Yeah. And it was it was scary, to be completely honest with sure. you. So against my wife's wishes, I said, I tell you what, I need another week. Good for you. So I, I went back <clears throat> and uh, and was there another week. And I've been sober ever since. So congratulations! Um, I'm just happy you weren't watching Titanic. Yeah, right. I don't right? think you would ever got I, off I the couch. I would have went down. I, 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 I'd be like, <laughs> or, uh, fucking like you know, Sweet Home Alabama, some crazy shit. I, I was hoping the second movie wasn't going to be Titanic because I'm like, man, I, no, no, it's fucking cheesy. Because I mean, I'm, he'd be going for the gown and a half after that for fucking. Yeah. Oh, I'll never. Shit, let I think go. I still fucking cry when I watch. It. I'll never let go. <laughs> So Chris, is this so? Do you go from alcohol to play with EIN numbers, or, or what does EIN? Well, the, the, the EIN lead, lead into it, Chris, because because you were explaining a little bit before we started. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, Larry and I were just talking about you know entrepreneurship. You got a lot of all, the three of us have started a lot of different businesses, and there are a lot of start uglies. You know, I always talk <laughs> about what's your start ugly. Don't feel bad about it. Kind of like you're talking about your whole life here and opening up. And I haven't heard some of this stuff, so I'm I'm you know it's pretty amazing what he's sharing. But uh, Larry had a good business he had started, so you had a, you have a couple, and then I, I know is Tom that and in I Start Ugly? In. The the no the book is the Start Ugly book is just a book about helping people read a story about someone that's stuck that needs to get out of their own way, kind of like what Larry was talking about. So it's a it's a this book takes place when a um, it's a fiction in 1900s. They're putting down the telephone poles in Manhattan Island, and a young kid was riding his bike for his R and D research lab at a axe factory they're cutting wood lumberjacks and his bike chain gets caught up on the telephone pole and he's like you know if i could take a bicycle chain and rotate it i think it could cut wood faster than an axe and the owner thinks he's a sure. fucking moron because he's like no one would swing a bike chain you moron <laughs> so eventually the story goes into what happens but it's about the owner not being smart enough to see the opportunity and i just think all of us there's opportunities everywhere but when I was talking about it with Larry, we were hanging out. He, he found, started telling he me. He had an opportunity with some EIN He had, numbers. listen, Larry is the king of opportunity. <laughs> he had some opportunities that I was like, wow, you, you're the man. But you got to tell him that opportunity about the the, the, the yeah, EIN numbers. I mean, a lot of these came while I was still drinking. So <laughs> after sobriety, I, kinda, I wasn't quite as creative for a while. But <laughs> I definitely had some creative business ventures. And you're talking about the EIN numbers. One of the most interesting ones was. I realized that people, when starting a business, didn't know how to get their tax ID or their EIN number. And if you go online, there's really wasn't a whole lot of resources on where to go. And if you're ignorant to the fact that you just go to the IRS website, it's there's links to go get it. All you do is download the form, fill it out, and get your EIN number. 
So I started a website called TaxIDSolutions.com. And I put a PayPal front end on it. And I started the, the thing that made this work, though, not just the creativity of, of directing people and selling knowledge. Right. I knew where to go get it. And I'm just I'm providing a service. I know something you don't know. Just pay me for it. And I'll tell you. But it was pay-per-click campaigns were relatively new back in the day at, during this time as well. And that's why I say this was before I got sober, because pay-per-click came around well before I got sober. What's a pay-per-click campaign? Paper, cl- pay-per-click. So uh, Google. Oh, ad- pay-per-click. Yeah, I, pay-per-click. I, I, I thought you said Paper clip. No, paper. I, I, I talk fast. Sorry, Tommy. Tommy was correct. What but he said that's what I heard too. But I understand what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> he put paper. the dagger, okay. not me. Okay, okay. <laughs> so your Google, Texas accent is yeah, where? Is that, uh, yeah, he gives me shit for saying. Do you Who not says, say? Do you not where? Say, he goes where? Do you he not says? say the H in where? 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 Right. Where? Fuck. where? Thank but you. I, but I say, what do we say? Because we're from Philly, like soda. Yeah. How do you say so? What do what, what do we always get? Well, our, the one that people down here never know is. Okay, I'm not going to say Pop. the word. I'm going to see what you say. It's a long sandwich, long. Okay, long. Like, yeah. And it has meat and cheese on it. What do you call that? That's just a sub. You call this? We call it a hoagie. A hoagie, yeah. 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 There, there's another word that everybody says you say it where, but I can't remember. I'll think of it. See, I, back home we call every beverage, uh, carbonated beverage, is a Coke. I mean, it's just, uh, hey, yeah. let me get a Coke. And What do you want, Dr. Pepper? Okay, see, like in Pennsylvania, what's really odd, if you're in Philly, in the east, you'll say soda. If you go to Pittsburgh West, it's pop, all pop. pop. Everything's right. fucking pop. This right. girl's like, can you get me a pop? What the fuck is a pop? We get a little pop back home, back okay. in Texas. We get a little bit, but we don't really get soda. Yeah. Yeah. And then, weird. Uh, and then the, the ice cream. What do you put on top of the ice cream? Sprinkles. Ah, see, so that's different. Some people call it sprinkles, and other people call it jimmies. Oh, that Jimmy Jimmy's shit. I heard that. I thought that was I have never, I've never heard, heard Jimmy's. I thought, yeah, I heard it. They Jimmy's, Jimmy's like condom. I mean, yeah, that's, that's I, what's all. You put the Jimmy's I, on. I, I you put a Jimmy on my Sunday? I don't know. That's yeah, a, I, I don't really want Jimmy on my Sunday. Yeah, so I, don't, I, I, don't I just want, said fucking Jimmy's. sprinkles. <laughs> <laughs> so I used pay per click advertising to. <laughs> right, I said it yeah, slow I that time. Like how he brings it back. That's great. I said it slow that time. So. Uh, I use that to take words like tax ID and use that. And I paid, I don't know, a nickel a click. But I got my ads for TaxIDSolutions.com at the very top of Google. So if you typed in, how do I get my tax ID number? Tax ID, I had that word. My ad comes up first. It's the first result. So people would click on that ad. And they'd go, oh, yeah, I want my tax ID. So they'd pay nine ninety five, And I'd give them a hyperlink to the IRS.gov site. And they'd download the form <laughs> oh, and off they go. God, that's awesome. And it rocked, dude. It rocked for, I don't know, a couple of years. It was great. Until PayPal. I got a couple of complaints, one or two here or there. And uh, probably more than that, because PayPal come and they shut me down. Oh, yeah. And Jeez. I got I got banned from PayPal for about 10 years before I could get back on PayPal. Oh, wow. I'm about, about yeah. 30 banned. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, at least thirty. At least thirty. At least. Well, well. Let me ask you this: Have you ever gotten a cease and desist from Paris Hilton's attorney? I have not gotten that. I have. How'd you get that? Yeah, selling one night in Paris on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be proud yeah. of that. <laughs> Damn, well, winner! Tell, tell, tell that story. And I'm proud of you for that. <laughs> Great job. And I got it at the office. It came to my place of business because. <laughs> I did all my most of my eBay shit. Would I do it at work? You know, because I'd have some downtime, so I would do my eBay shit at work, and I was selling the one night in Paris. And I guess I had used my work address for my my eBay account. I don't know. I, I had to have because the letter came to my inbox at the office. I went down and checked my mail, and I'm like, "What the hell is this?" And it was a cease and desist letter. I would have been walking around the office. Look what I got, guys! Uh, Look no, what I, I got! Raise, raise for this guy! Raise, Frame raise. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, that was a hundred percent, and I showed it to a few friends, you know. But uh, yeah, I kept it out of the eyes of, of of the people that would have mattered at the time. But very cool. uh, But yeah, that was that's. I, I did all kinds of crazy shit. I mean, we would uh, another one that I did. I was heavy into ATVs. I had a Yamaha Raptor back in the day, and uh, I would sell the uh, Yamaha uh, ATV manuals, like user manuals. Burn them to a CD, sell them on eBay for ten bucks. Uh, just anything like that, man. Any kind of little awesome. side hustle, yeah. you know. Um, and that eventually led me to where I'm like, this works. This pay-per-click advertising works. Um, why not start a real business this way? So I started a pool company. And I shit you not, it, I haven't had it since about 2007. I just got a text today. Somebody goes, I realize Pristine Pool and Spa Service doesn't have a website. I'm like, no shit. It's been gone for 10 fucking years. Of course <laughs> it doesn't have a website. But I did that to build the business. And I started a real uh pool service business where we would service pools and do repairs and remodels and all that stuff 
and I built it 100% off the back of pay-per-click advertising. So that was super, super strong back then. And I use it today, even for podcast advertising. I still use it for, for different clients and different applications. It's not as... It's not as lucrative now as it was back then because it was so new that you could get words really a nickel, a dime, right you know? Yeah. yeah, but now you'll pay for that same. I mean, hell, who knows what tax ID goes for now? It's probably five, ten bucks a click, you know, or whatever. So it's just not as affordable to do it. But back then it was cake, and I used it every chance I got. Now, I want to ask both of you this because I saw it was either yesterday or today. Uh, can you pull up tab two? Yep. <clears throat> Apple is, they're saying they're slow, they're starting to slow hiring. To me, that says they're done hiring. I saw that, yeah. So, uh, yeah, here, Apple to Apple slow to hiring, spending for teams next year, Bloomberg News. So scroll down, Rob. So now, how do you guys, both of you, with them slowing down, how does that affect a podcaster? Does it affect a podcaster? And how does it, f it affect us uh, in the U.S. that use Apple devices? I'll let you take that, Chris, and while I think well, about it. Well, the majority I don't... of their income comes from hardware. So for podcasting, uh, we've kind of plateaued anyway, so I think we're okay. But this is the hardware, all their, I mean, you know, people are not going to be buying stuff for the next couple of years. Well, and I think to piggyback on that, as far as podcasting goes, I mean, Apple's got a ton of competition with podcasting from the Spotify space Spotify, anyways. Spotify, yeah. And not just Spotify, but YouTube is- Amazon. They're, they're, yeah, for, yeah, yeah, and they're Amazon made, too, yeah. they're taking over. YouTube is where it's at right now, guys. If you want to grow a podcast and you want to start a podcast from the ground up and really grow it, YouTube's your best option right now. And the reason is it's one self-contained ecosystem. You know, growing a podcast that's audio only is a, it's very, very difficult to do it and do it well. And even though we're seeing this, this, this reduction overall from Apple, I, I, I don't see that it's going to affect us as podcasters much because the industry is evolving. And I know I'm going to catch some shit when some of the old timers hear this episode and I catch shit anyways, but the term podcast has evolved. You know, podcast typically was defined as an audio program that was driven by an RSS feed. So, but however, you the chips are made, right? We need chips. Uh, so we, we do like, need chips. Well, like so, right now, when that says, because I don't understand this shit, it says Apple shares reverse course to trade down one point six percent at one forty seven point six. So, I, I guess, Chris, what does that mean? This means their stock price dropped. Yeah, oh, of that's all that means. Yeah, that's all it means. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. So, is that like a big deal to read that? Nah, one point six percent. I wouldn't consider that a big deal. Oh, I mean, well, they no. the whole economy slowing down. We yeah. know that it's you know. Yeah, we we know what it's at, but yeah, okay. yeah. So as podcasters, I don't think it's going to. I think us that at all. sends a signal to people: be careful how you're spending, save some of your money because it's going to get kind of tight when Apple is saying we're stopping so, Tesla, Meta, all these companies. Right. See, now I look at it as affecting podcasters because, like that board back there, that Black Magic has chips in it. Sure. That soundboard has chips in it. Sure. Right. If you can't get them, forget about China hitting Taiwan. Let's just say there's not enough chips right. being made. Right. Then that would affect. I mean, that's going to affect. Well, yeah, to a degree. Yeah, most definitely, because you can't get the gear to record a podcast. Oh, so Tommy, but, I get it. You're saying that the supply chain is affecting them trying to sell stuff. Right. So, right. like the way I look at, I mean, it, that's true too. <clears throat> the way I'm looking at it as not necessarily just Apple, because like they're doing this, then others will follow. And if they do, then the equipment needed to do a professional podcast right. is going to be extremely hard to get or, you know, out of this world expensive because there's no chips, there's no people to make them. They're you're out you're them. already seeing that. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for a Sony EB10 camera right now. They're nearly impossible to find because they can't get the chips to manufacture the damn Where are the thing. chips coming from, Taiwan? That I couldn't answer. Hmm. But that that's why I you're, you, yeah, you're already an seeing overall, that sort of thing. from a uh, bigger situation. yeah from a creator perspective sure getting the gear is getting more challenging and the gear that is available it's getting more expensive I mean some of the cameras that were running four or five hundred bucks are now seven eight hundred bucks so from that perspective I mean it's putting podcasting or as, as you put it a minute ago a high quality professional quality podcast it's putting that out of reach for a lot of the lower end hobbyist independent type creators so and both of you what would you say two years ago. If you wanted to just start a one-on-one -on -one podcast, minimum equipment, but good enough, how, how much would you say it would cost? Say, I mean, if you're not doing video. No, you're doing video. Oh, you're doing video. I, I would Larry would take that. It's going to cost you a couple grand. Yeah, it still costs you $1,500, $1, to $1,500. Now, and what would that be today? Just roughly. Yeah, cost. around three grand. Yeah. Okay, now if you're doing audio two years ago, what would it cost? A couple hundred bucks. What would it cost today? 
Well, if you've got an into the same price, not much. Not much. So Maybe three hundred bucks because you'd upgrade your minor. mic. You get yeah, you get something better. Yeah, they they've got better mics now. So that's one of the things that we have seen. Even though with USB, the, right? Yeah, Larry, you still got some some lower end mics that have improved tremendously in quality. So some of the mics that weren't available then are available now, and they're in, in a very similar price point. So they're not going to sound like the Shure SM7B like we're using today, but they're still going to sound really really good. And they're still just plug and play USB mics that go directly into your laptop oh, or fair. PC or whatever. So now, when do you two meet? We met in 2020. Oh, so you it, met way later. Yeah, 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 way, way later. And I only met him because I went to PodFest. Um, I'd already been to a, a several other uh, podcasting conferences, and I'd heard PodFest was great, and it was different. It was tremendous and just a whole hell of a lot of fun. So I said, all right, let's go. So I went, and uh, I sat down, and some chick walked up and started talking to me because, I mean, look, um, no, but anyway. <laughs> but, no, street she, cred. Yeah, street street you know, cred only. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we ended up kind of just chatting or whatever, and it was trivia night. So PodFest has a, a – a, a, what do you call it? A tradition of kicking things off with trivia. Trivia night. warfare, yeah. Yeah. So uh, she goes, "Hey, you want to go play trivia?" I'm like, ah, "I guess so." So we tore ass to trivia, and and it was the room was packed because we were one of the last ones in there, and I ended up getting stuck at some table with a lot of people I didn't know. So and it was right at the front too. Well, we ended up hitting it off with everybody at the table, and ironically enough, our entire our entire table won the whole thing, and the winning table got a free ticket to the next year's event, and we also got the opportunity to meet Chris. How great was that? So got to go up on stage, get our picture made with the man himself. And that was the first time that we ever met. Now, I personally don't remember how it progressed beyond that, but we just stayed in touch, uh, worked on a couple of different projects together and the friendship just continued to grow and grow. And here we are a couple of years later, you know, kicking it with you. So he's, now, did you see something modest. in him? Yeah, he, he helps a lot of people and I see that. So then I would always pay attention when you see someone. So he's helped a lot of people. So my job is to make sure if someone's helping people, I want to help them. Was so, that the biggest thing you saw? Yeah, him? yeah. He would. He was always helping people on the Zoom because then we went into COVID lockdown. So when we did these Guinness World Record breaking events, he'd be on the Zooms. He'd be helping people. He was in the chat, and those people they stick out because they're you know leaders in the community. And then one day I was talking about it, I was trying to do a newsletter for the podcast community, and then Larry said I think I could you know be the editor for that. And that led one thing to another. Now he's the editor of one of the largest newsletters in the world, like for podcasters. It's pretty big. He's really good at it. People love reading it. Yeah, and, and we'll backtrack, but you brought yeah. that up. So yeah. I mean, that, that's a that's a hell of a, a thing to take on. So what when, when you're an editor of like podcast magazine, right? What exactly is an editor? Or, like, or well, podcast or, messenger. Pod, yeah, yeah. I, want, <laughs> I, I want to pull that Only back a little bit. Only because there is a podcast magazine. There is a podcast magazine, and I am not the editor of podcast magazine, so I don't want any brand confusion there, uh, and I don't want anybody. Can you guys me. just call it different names, like like podcast <laughs> messenger, podcast I know, fucking it's all magazine? Pod something. Can't you just call it the like <laughs> just the call magazine? It Larry's for, Larry's, uh, for, uh, Larry's podcast magazine. It may, or like maybe it'll evolve to that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it'll evolve to that. So, but it's the podcast messenger. And what was the question again? Because I just wanted. To clarify well, the branding there. Let's just go back. What the hell is Podfest Messenger? <laughs> okay, there we go. So the Podfest Messenger, you know, the thing that sets Podfest apart, and I'm going to sound like a fucking commercial here, but the the thing that sets Podfest apart from all the other podcast conferences out there is the sense of community that comes from the event itself and the people involved in the event. And I really felt it that first time back in 2020 when I went. That's what I had heard, that you go there, they're going to accept you in, you're going to feel like one of the old timers, and everybody just helps everybody, and it's just uh, just awesome. And I went there and experienced that, and that's really what it feels like. It feels totally different. I mean, I've been on about 10 stages this year from L.A. to New Jersey and everywhere in between at a variety of different podcast conferences, speaking on podcasting, and nothing feels like PodFest. Just doesn't. It's just that sense of community, that sense of camaraderie, that sense of everybody helping everybody, everybody lifting everybody up, and everybody wanting each other to succeed. It just, it's not matched any, anywhere. Is it the brotherhood that separates it from everything else? Like the, like you said, camar camaraderie, you know, like military, they always yeah. say like brotherhood, you know, yeah. my brother. I mean, blah, it's, blah. it's different, you know? I mean, I, I, I relate it back to, you know, my fight team and the guys that were with me on the fight team. We've got a bond for life that you can't re, you can't recreate that anywhere. Right. And so this is similar on a different, in a different level of experience, but it's that same thing. It's that same bond. It's that same, er, nobody's 
undercutting anybody else. Everybody's uplifting. Everybody's sharing. Everybody is just wanting everybody to succeed. And I mean, especially today, you don't see that very many places at all. I mean, most of the time, people are looking to take you out at the knees and they're looking to climb over your back to step over you or whatever it may be. And you just don't experience that there. And we wanted to extend that to the community on an ongoing basis. And one of the best ways to do that is with a newsletter. So Chris came up with the idea. He actually has a documentary video called The Messengers, right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Podcast documentary. We made a documentary about the world of podcasting. And, and it's called The Messengers. So he played on that name and said, let's start the PodFest Messenger and let's start the newsletter. So he and I got together. We collaborated on the ideas and came up with a template. That was out in Texas, remember? No, that I was don't. in Dallas. We're having barbecue at your place. That's right. He he was in Texas for another event, and I came and got him, and we went to have barbecue because he had never had Texas barbecue. <laughs> so we said, good. It's good, but I've had Texas barbecue, but thank you for saying that. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I thought he hadn't had Texas barbecue, so thank you for calling me out on the fucking podcast. Thanks. <laughs> could've waited, you could have waited until after. Uh, yeah, you could have corrected me in the car. But anyway, uh, so we sat there, we played it out. It's and Chris K., you know that. I know. Fucking squirrel. I'm not going to fucking try to say the name. <laughs> uh, well, what was it? Christmas O's. I don't Christmas fucking O's. know. I don't yeah. know. I just know K. No, I'm sticking with uh, K. Call me Christmas. Go ahead. I'm totally <laughs> making a meme of Christmas O's. I promise <laughs> you. We're, we're going to make an NFT. Um, <laughs> but we decided to go ahead to start the messenger and we wanted to give that sense of community to the community every week and twice a week so that's what we do so our goal with the with the podcast messenger is to make sure that we're including content that provides value to the community a lot of podcasters they struggle with just a handful of the same exact problems how do i get more downloads how do i monetize my show where do i get sponsors how do i work my gear you know just all the basic questions so we make sure that the content that's in the messenger that we we release it on tuesdays and thursdays that type of content is what we put in the messenger but it goes beyond that because again we wanted to be about the community so we make sure that we also include people in the community in every issue of the newsletter and I tell you, man, it, it, you don't see the excitement in somebody's face often enough that you see when you put them in a newsletter and it goes out to tens of thousands of people and their podcast is featured in the community hot take. It, it's just, it's amazing. And they feel so great about it. They feel included and they are. And that's the whole point is we want to include everybody in the community. We want to uplift them. We want to highlight them. We want to make sure that their work is getting the, the notoriety that it deserves. You know, just because somebody doesn't have a Joe Rogan level podcast doesn't mean that their work is unappreciated or unnecessary. It's very necessary. You know, we just shared my story and I talked about it before how, you know, everybody's heard the, the recovery story, blah, blah, blah. Somebody may have needed to hear it my way, you know, and we didn't even go into the, the, the other end of mine. Mine's my way because I don't I don't do any therapy beyond that. I left and I was done. And I'm not saying AA is bad for anybody that uses it. I think it's fucking great. But I personally chose to just walk away. And that was why my story is different. I don't do AA. I don't live in the past. I don't introduce myself. Hi, I'm Larry. I'm an alcoholic. That's not my bag. That's not for me. It works for some folks and that's great. And even for me, I but walked out for on me. 40 some therapists. Yeah. My so, mom wanted yeah. to kill me. She, she told me I need to every, as soon as they said, how was your day? Fuck you. I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, I got to tell don't you. Don't ask me I, about my fucking day. I fucking hated my therapist in, in rehab too, but they wouldn't let me switch. So kudos to them for not letting me switch, but whatever. I didn't, I just didn't care <laughs> for that. But, but that's my point there is, is that your story matters no matter who you are, whether you are Joe Rogan or you're a John Smith, your story matters. So put it out there. And we want to make sure that we, we uplift and we highlight everybody that put for, put forth that effort to tell their story and share their story. So that's what the message is about. But now, when you guys do this, how do you go about the order? You know, because somebody might get pissed that you don't have them on page one or page two. We see that. 50. We see, we see that so, every once so in a while. How do you narrow down the order? There's like, so many things that we list. There's enough spots for everybody. So, you know, we, we it goes out twice a week. So we always correct it. And, you know, we always but how do, you, how do you decide where you're going to put what? That's him. He's the editor. So he decides <laughs> what's most important. Yeah. It's, it's not, and, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna correct to the you community. a little bit. It's not what's most important. It's just the story at the time. Yeah, what they need. And, and, and what they need at the time. And it's not of who I'm going to, to, to feature or when I'm going to feature them. It, it, it's, I try to feature everyone. But in one of our efforts, we do a variety of things to keep the community involved. We have every month on the second Tuesday of the month, we also have the Pod Lab, which is a virtual event that lasts for one hour. It's got a little educational component and it brings the community together. 
during the pod lab and in our Facebook group and our social media, we put questions out to the community as well. So if they go in and they answer these questions, that gives me another opportunity to highlight those that take the time to answer the question. So if you're involved in the community, the odds of you being featured within the community are exponentially higher. So there, there's some strategy involved there. We want people to feel like they're part of the community, but we also want them to interact in the community. So we structure everything we do in a way that instigates that engagement. It sounds extremely Machiavellian. Always available. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was like, and, "Who the fuck is Machiavelli?" I don't. Oh, know. no, I'm just kidding. Uh, not read off. Yeah, you read. You read the book. <laughs> yes. Oh, you yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's two. That's yeah. two. Uh, uh, we got we to gotta take a. We got to have a chart here. Yeah. That's two people that have read yeah, the book. We're, now. we're like two for two twenty. <laughs> you guys are talking about mac and cheese. <laughs> no, no, just no, Nicolius Machiavelli. Mac and cheese. Uh, yeah, mac and cheese. Yeah. The philosopher. He, the prince is called the yeah, prince. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's very very good. You should read it. I've never read it. No, I know of the book. I haven't read it. You're a big reader. Yeah. Yeah. So. So then in 2015. Yeah. Which is now Podboost, right? Because it was, what did you have? It, well, it comes up as readily random, but then okay. it redirects All to right. Podbus, so which kind of If we're, we're going to dial it back to my story, after rehab, how did I even get into podcasting? I've been in podcasting for eight years now. And I got into podcasting because I didn't know what the fuck I was going to do with my life after getting sober. And a buddy of mine kept telling me, I know you love the UFC. You got to listen to Joe Rogan's podcast. Like, I don't need to listen to some podcast. That shit is for nerds. I don't have time for it. Besides, I got to go home and play World of Warcraft. So, <laughs> that's a great game. <laughs> you play that, Tommy? Uh, Never played. I haven't played a video game since Sega Genesis. Dude, yeah. uh, okay, my addictive Sonic, personality right? got me addicted to w w what, the, what the cool kids call WoW. So I was, I was a uh, yeah. hardcore WoW nerd as well. A lot, of, a lot of time during my drinking. I would actually drink myself and pass out while playing the game quite often. But anyways. And that was more of just a joke because I wasn't really playing WoW after I got sober as much. <laughs> but I eventually listened to Joe Rogan, and my love for comedy became apparent again because the episode that I listened to had Joey Diaz and Tony Hinchcliffe on the oh, episodes. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, they were telling comedy the way that comedy was told in the 80s. And when I heard that, I was like, you can say this shit on a podcast? I can, say, <laughs> I can say fuck and not get in trouble? I said, I'm totally fucking in. So I went out and I was I was telling your producer before the before we got started, but I went out and I bought probably the worst possible mic for podcasting. It was a blue is the brand snowball. I bought that bullshit too. Okay, yeah, I bought that bullshit too. Yeah, so since some trash cans. Somewhere. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I bought Aren't that. You had those? Yeah. And a buddy of mine was an open micer at the time in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So I reached out to him. I said, hey, Jamie, uh, do you want to start a podcast? He's like, what the fuck is a podcast? And so I told him. And we said, yeah, let's do it. So we're just, we just went balls to the wall. We're going to be as filthy as we want to be. It's just going to be the worst of the worst. So we took that, that, blue, that uh, Yeti snowball, and we sat down on the ottoman in my game room, and we gingerly held it in our hands and cupped it ever so gently and we said our piece of whatever we were saying that I would pass it over to Jamie and then he would gently grab it and he would say his part and then he would pass it back and we did this for like a fucking hour until we recorded a podcast and then we listened back and because we just were wide open it was horrible I mean we said the most raunchy the most horrific shit and we're like bro we can't release this <laughs> So it probably so, would have done a million. It, it probably would have, in all honesty. So, but we deleted that one and we started over. And the very first podcast that I ever launched was called Accidentally the Whole Tip. Mm. I say that so you can marinate it on it for a second. That's what so, I'm doing. I'm just yeah. waiting for you to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just what it, you know, you, you hear just the tip. And this was Accidentally the Whole Tip. And it was a comedy podcast. And Good clickbait. I would click to see what the fuck it is. Exactly. Mean. Exactly. So, uh, and it did really well. I mean, just because of the content, and at the time, it was still kind of wild, wild west of podcasting, and you could get an audience pretty easy back then just by telling dirty jokes, you know what I mean? So that's exactly what we did. But we took it even further. We weren't satisfied with it just being a podcast. We went down to the Arts District of Dallas. It's called Deep Ellum down there. And we got on an internet radio show, and <laughs> they, they stuck us in the worst possible time slot. They gave us Sunday morning at 10 a.m., so we've got the raunchiest show in the world, and we literally followed a preacher. He would come out of the studio, and we would go in. So we went after a preacher. We went after a preacher. So, and it's Sunday morning, but we still managed to take the show. They had thirty-five shows on their roster, and we went from thirty-five up to five before they shut the studio down. So we did pretty good, even in that scenario. But we weren't satisfied with that either, so we said we want to take this to a live stage show. Because Kill Tony was was going on back then. I don't know if you're familiar with Kill yeah, Tony. Yeah, it's Tony yeah. Hinchcliffe's show. And we loved that. Well, I loved that show. Jamie wasn't all that familiar with it at the time. 
But I loved Kill Tony, and I've been on it a couple of times myself. Bombed miserably, and they totally destroyed me, but it's out there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we said, let's take it to the stage. Let's just take the tip to the stage. So uh, we looked around for some place to take it, and restaurants, as I call them, are really big in Texas. Uh, you know, the Hooters and Twin Peaks and that sort of thing. But Texas, we do things different. We had another one called Redneck Heaven. And Redneck Heaven was kind of like, if you've ever seen Roadhouse, it kind of reminded me of the Double Deuce. And that's essentially what it was. And we thought we were going to take it there. We wanted to take it there so bad. We had meetings with their big dogs and everything, but it never made it to Redneck Heaven, regrettably. But that didn't stop us. We kept looking. And we finally found a club that would let us take the tip to the stage. So we started it on a Monday night. This guy said, yeah, let's get some comedy in here. And we started doing that. And we weren't doing the exact same thing as Kill Tony. We were just doing a lot of crowd work while doing the podcast from the stage. And at the time, I still worked in corporate America, and the show was getting pretty big. We had a lot of people at the office that, that loved the show, even the HR director at the time. She freaking loved the show. She was my biggest, still one of my biggest supporters to this day. I love her to death. I won't say her name because I don't want to get her in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but she loved it. But I got a new direct report manager, and he fucking hated it. Just This guy is as prude as prude gets, and he basically told me to kill the show or he's going to make my life miserable. So I had to walk away from the tip. But it stayed as a comedy show at this particular club. Jamie Gravitt is his name. He's an up-and-coming comedian now. He took it over, and uh, it evolved into an open mic for comedians in Dallas-Fort Worth. And to this day, it's still one of the larger open mics or largest open mics in Dallas-Fort Worth outside of a comedy club. So it ah, still exists. Congratulations, man. So it was amazing, yeah. yeah and still there. Yeah, still going strong to this day. And Jamie, he ended up, uh, he just finished up a residency in Las Vegas at the New Sahara as the opener for Eddie Griffin. Wow. So, And I saw you just had Hans Kim on your show yeah. a few weeks back, and he just got on Hans Kim's stage as well. So Hans, yeah. you know, yeah, Hans, Hans is just up. open for, he's opening for he Rogan. He opens for Rogan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. he's with all the, and he, he's doing the, the Kill Tony of dating. Uh -huh. Hans Kim is doing the kill, to kill yeah. Tony of dating. It's funny. Yeah, it's amazing. He, Hans is freaking yeah. hilarious. He, he yeah. actually comes out and like it's like a first date thing. You pick out it's exactly, as, but it's Hans. That is too but, funny. See, I hadn't even heard that yet. Yeah, he, so, he's a really good guy. He passed over the whole story though. You told me the story when you were talking before. Redneck Heaven. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> I looked it up. I pulled it up here. I'm gonna pull it up. Oh, did you find it? Did you find it? Yeah, because they're dead now. I mean, they're bankrupt now. Are they? What's this? And What's this one? Oh, that's it. Yeah, I guess they're not dead. They're, they're dead in Louis. Yeah, that one's dead. That's uh, Louisville. That's my. That's where I'm from. Is Louisville, and that that location is dead. July is wet paint uh, day, I guess. Or you can. Wet There's three locations. Paint. They're still around. I don't think they're around uh, anymore. I I know the Louisville is dead. But one of the big things there was minnow shots. You would go there. Oh. Yeah, that was the thing with this place is that it was they're next dead. level. If you're married, they're dead. <laughs> I used to, right, I, well, there's definitely two seventy five land shark pints. That's probably like five bucks right now. If that was yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, this can't this can't be up to date. But this is exactly what it was, and they never had really just uniforms. It was always costume days, like wet paint or lingerie or whatever. And one of the reasons I think that it was shut down is, I mean, you would get propositioned. I mean, for like 80 bucks, you could see your cooter or whatever. I mean, uh, <laughs> that happened to me. I mean, it's like, hey, you want to see it? I'm like, I can see it now, honey. You're not wearing anything but lingerie. But it was just next level. And the thing was that it was right next door to Red Lobster. So, <laughs> oh, fuck. So you'd have <laughs> families on, going in. Yeah, you, you got families going in to eat over here while all the redneck girls are coming out on the patio. <laughs> Serving drinks on the patio, and they're and that making be, more money than probably dancers. Oh, right? yeah, dude! Uh, if they I'll, start telling you that, yeah, they were all of them were either strippers or strippers in training. Is, is what it was. They were <laughs> strippers they were, in training. Yeah, they were That's trying to work their way to the pole. Is yeah. exactly what it was. <laughs> trying to work so, their way to the pole. But it, yeah, that place was great back in the day. We uh, we had a lot of fun there. They used to do these things called minnow shots. And it's literally, they have live minnows behind the bar, and you take your drink oh. of choice, they bring the live minnow to the, sta to the stage, to, to your table, <laughs> and they drop the live minnow in the shot, and you do the shot with the live minnow. Oh. Yeah. That's some Texas shit. That's that. some Texas that shit right Texas there. Shit. Would you do that? No, I mean, that poor fish. You know what I mean, you just want to drink. Why you got to kill a fish with it? What's up with it? I used to do them all the time. Well, at least the fish has got to be drunk by the time it gets Yeah, yeah, yeah. the fish is like sterilized okay. by the time it goes down. <laughs> but anytime we got somebody new at the office, we would take them to Redneck Heaven, and that was their initiation. Was it, yeah. they, they had to do a minnow shot. I mean, that was just mm -hmm. the thing. So that place was the shit back in the day. We had a lot of fun there, but they were just a little too 
I mean, they did. They went straight up double deuce style, and it just it got crazy. So they ended up closing up shop. I, I just maybe they're still at the other location. Maybe they're reopening. But, yeah, August is it's, naughty school girls. It says July fifteenth in Lewis. I'm yeah. telling you, I, I know. Might have to the, check that out. I know the. <laughs> I know it's empty, and there's there's fencing around the building. I know it's you not live right outside of there. I live in Louisville. That's where I live. All right. So your homework is to go home and tell us it's still open. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I will report back. I'll report back. <laughs> go to tab uh, four, Rob. Yep. Now this is I'll take me through this fight. This is your uh, pod boost. I started a podcast, and at the time, I didn't understand the game. Uh, you know, I didn't understand finding a niche. I didn't understand finding an audience. Uh, back in the MySpace days, I had a blog called Readily Random. So yeah, I just said, fuck it, I'll start a podcast called Readily Random. And it was the dumbest move I could possibly make as a wannabe podcaster because it told the audience absolutely nothing. Nobody knew what it was about. Well, it was random. I had the same fever that everybody else has when starting an interview podcast is they want to they be like Joe Rogan. They want to just interview anybody they want to and go as long as they want to and do whatever. they. You can't do that. It just doesn't work. Uh, so I started Readily Random as the podcast. But you know what? I'm going to make this a business. So I, I founded Readily Random, uh, Readily Random Media. I didn't even know what the name of my business is. But, <laughs> but it's a good name, yeah, though. Yeah, and a hell of a name to catch, too. It, it's great for media because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun name for, for a media company, not a fun name for a podcast. But Podcast Boost, as we keep referencing, that's the brand. That's the product that I offer. So what I do is I help brands, businesses, and organizations launch branded podcasts. So I tend to lean more towards uh, companies and, and businesses and people that kind of have a marketing budget. Okay, so Rob, go to the tab right before that. Okay, so here, right, Larry? So yeah, this is this is me. I know it's, it's shaded, but that's just how the website's designed. It's me on stage speaking. That's primarily what I do now is speak on stages about podcasting. Go up to uh, services at the top. It's funny, you were talking about uh, equipment. We, I, I thought I saw him click on equipment, but Podcast Boost, this is the service that we provide here. So uh, we do everything from planning the podcast. You know, one of the things that I like to tell people about are my seven P's of podcasting, and that's proper previous planning prevents poor podcast performance. Wow, oh, that's please. fucking good. Yeah, right? So I'm a bit of a bit of a marketing that's genius. That's very good. No, <laughs> thanks, that's I appreciate really that. Good. Yeah, wow. so... The whole thing is that we we plan out the podcast. We we launch a podcast with a plan and a purpose, and I help you determine what that plan is. And from there, we do everything. All right, hey Rob, pull up uh, the hardware, and then uh, take us through that. The very top. Yeah. Yep. Says, yep. Got it. So this is the problem I had when I first started. That's yeah, not knowing what to you. get. Hell no, because you know they make it look so good. You can go on eBay, and it's like, here's this package: yeah. camera, a 16 gigabyte uh, SD card. What's that going to do? Seven, right. Seven ten or one, you know, two pixels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're gonna get a frame or two. So take me through the equipment. Well, and this was this is this is kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. But for the clients that I work with, I work with hiring clients with bigger budgets. So I don't introduce them to the lower end equipment. You know, you wanted to start a professional podcast that sounds and looks professional. That's the gear that I recommend. So I, I don't I don't have anything on my website that's not the cat daddy of of equipment. So it's the Sure SMB SM7B, just like we're using today. Good shit, yeah. uh, the SM7B, it's a little power hungry, so I recommend a cloud lifter to go with it. I love the Rodecaster Pro. It makes it easy for the the new podcaster if you're setting up a home studio or a business studio. Rodecaster Pro is great for doing that as well. So those are your three top choices. You come on down a little bit. Those are the headphones that I recommend. I mean, I use those. I've got probably, I don't know, a dozen pairs of them from the wireless to every color they come in, you name it. And then depending on how you want to set it up, uh, if you want a boom arm, I got a boom arm that I, I recommend for you. If you want a desktop, I love these Ultima arms that you're using. I love these. But for the newer podcaster, they're a little pricey. Yeah. So, you know, I give them the Gator Frameworks. It's like 35 or 40 bucks or something. So. I, I actually have that one at home. Yeah. Like when I have to do reads. Yeah. Uh, the, only th the only thing that I don't like about it, like in a podcast, is that damn bar. Yeah. It's so long. But you're right. It's affordable and it's very sturdy and Frameworks makes good stuff. Yeah, they do. So, like you said, if you're starting, and I and I do use it at home, and it's fine. It's yeah, just for I, like I, I use it. I use it at home. Yeah, I, I love the the low profile look. 
Because if you look at the new designs of some of the, the newer podcasts, you don't see the boom arms as much. People don't want that hanging down in their face anymore because we're leaning so heavily on video now that that boom arm's distracting. You don't want it in the fucking shot. So the the low profile underneath coming up type mics, that's the kind of setup that we're seeing. And you can achieve that with the Gator Works. Uh, and, and, and another thing that important. shocked me, because I w- what I was worried about was putting uh, one of these on that's yeah. heavier. Yeah, yeah. And I was shocked how heavy that the bottom of that is. The bottom because is they're heavy, not right? expensive, and I was really shocked. It's like a 30, 20 pound weight on that. Yeah, thing. it's heavy. It, 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 it's heavy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I threw it at my wife the other day, and no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I was like, Damn it! Sorry, honey, I didn't know it was that heavy. <laughs> so, but no, I love it. It's it's a great little uh, little stand there. So. And then, you know, we come down to the video equipment. This is where a lot of people drop the ball because they use just a USB, uh, w- w- uh, just some shitty webcam. And you can't get that look that you want with the webcam. A lot of people use Zoom for their recording. You might have saw Riverside at the top. They're one of my sponsors, so I recommend Riverside. But I don't recommend them just because they're a sponsor. They have a great platform because it's everything's in high def. You get high definition audio. You get high definition video. It looks phenomenal. It looks a lot better than Zoom. A lot of podcasters are stuck on Zoom. This will give you this ca- this camera set up here, the Canon Mark 50, and uh, the little the little 22 millimeter lens will give you that bokeh effect that everybody wants, that slightly soft blurred background and that nice crisp focus on you. That's exactly what this setup will pro- will provide. Uh, then if you want to use it as a webcam, you got to have a little starter kit there, uh, and then just some lighting and some uh, and, a, and a tripod. You know, you, those you don't have to use either one of those, but it's just th- I love the GBM that little two pack some great lighting for a, for a home or business studio. And then what, what made you expand with this site where you have the hardware, how to do things? What, what made you keep adding to it, going with it, adding new things just as time went on? I saw there was an opportunity. I, I saw there was an opportunity for independent podcasters that wanted to step their game up. And, you know, I, I, I worked for that same company that I've mentioned a couple of times. I worked for them for 21 years. And, I mean, that's how long they stuck with me and all my bullshit. So <laughs> kudos to them for doing that once again. But I stepped out January 4th of last year to do this full time because I saw that opportunity and I started building. And as I progressed, I did see, though, that working with the independent podcaster, a lot of times they don't really have a budget. And while I still love working with independent podcasters and helping them, I've kind of shifted my focus to literally just helping the independent podcaster and not necessarily taking them as clients because they don't have a budget. So uh, it was either uh, I'm going to starve to death or (laughs) (laughs) you're on many choices. Yeah. (laughs) And I like to eat. So I had to kind of change directions. And that's where I realized that. And two, we we see a shift in the industry. Branded podcasts are super, super impactful for businesses and brands. They're huge. Everybody has to have a podcast right now. You have to find a new way to connect with your audience. So seeing that and constantly preaching the gospel of the power of a branded podcast made me realize that there are companies out there that need this service. And I stepped out and the opportunity was there. And so I took it. When somebody says branded podcast, what does that mean to you? Like, how what would you say a branded podcast is? Well, there's different kinds. You got corporations that have a branded podcast. You have networks that have a lot of money, so they're going to brand a new concept. So he's talking about people that got money behind to push out the marketing, whereas independents don't have much of anything. You know, they're lucky if they get the equipment going and they put it out. I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. 100%. Talking about yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, companies are looking to reach newer audiences and they're re- looking to interact with their existing customer base or clients on an entirely different level. And that's where your branded podcast comes into play because you're building on your brand. You know, too many times people think about their brand and whether it's a podcast brand or any brand whatsoever. And people tend to lean into it and think that it's a logo or it's a set of colors or it's the, a design, whatever it may be. That's not your fucking brand, dude. That's just a representation of your brand. Your brand goes so much deeper than that. And companies and businesses are realizing that their brand goes deeper than that, and they can leverage that brand. I mean, if you think about a a brand out there that's all about quality, they can take that same quality and they can tell stories about the growth of their business and the history of their business and demonstrate that quality through stories and interact with their clients and their audience on an entirely different level. And that's where a branded podcast comes into play. I see. And, and on that alone, it would hit because this is, let's just say, like a massive company. Now they go to do a podcast. Everybody wants to know like how Amazon actually works or how Apple works, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, 100%. So who, who's not going to watch that? I mean, Jack Daniels has an amazing brand podcast they probably have one of the best 
It's, really? It, yeah, it's it's amazing because I mean it tells the history of the of the of of the, the what is it fucking whiskey? I can't even remember off the top yeah. of my head. Abla 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 Been sober for a day or two, folks. But I mean, they, they still have an amazing podcast, yeah. and they they bring you into the burnt barrels that they use for the aging process. And now it's coming back to me. So, <laughs> but they bring you into that, and they make you feel like you're a part of it, and you get to experience that history. And you get to experience that brand on an entirely different level. Makes sense. And that's how they get connected with their already existing customer base and maybe even draw in more with these great stories that they're telling and the great history and really establishing that brand on an entirely different level. Now, when Larry opens this up in 2015, what's the podcast industry like at this I'm particular glad you time. mentioned that because when you'd go on the um, iTunes charts, it's all little guys that you never heard of were the top dogs in the world. I think Dave Ramsey was only one of the only big names. <laughs> but yeah. imagine people you've never heard of being the top 100 of whatever. And they were making a lot of money. And that was in 2013. 2015 is when people started smelling the money and they started creating these branded podcasts. Now, so you have to remember... Uh, do you know who John Lee Dumas is? Mm -mm. Right. So you never heard it. So this gentleman was the largest entrepreneur podcast in 2013 to 2015. But now you don't know who he is. He's still big. Don't get me wrong. But these big companies and brands have come in. So back then you could have been anyone started a podcast if it had a decent, you know, hey, I'm talking to business owners and you grew that audience. You could be huge right now. So it's just interesting how there was there wasn't enough creators for the listeners. It was a very rare experience. And then, Chris, when did it go from not enough to where now it's really getting popular? I would say last couple of years. Uh, before COVID, I would say 2019, it started getting pretty saturated, if yeah, that's what it, you're asking. it went nuts. When and COVID. now it's COVID. Everybody started podcasting yeah. on COVID. Yeah, so it went, oh, it went, it jumped the the shark in that now we have too much content. But now I just updated the numbers about a week and a half ago because I did a presentation back in Dallas. And currently on Apple Podcasts, there's just over 2.4 million podcasts. Mm. Now out of those 2.4 million, only about 476,000 are what they call active, meaning that they've published at least 10 episodes and they've published at least one episode in the last 90 days. So it shows you there that 2 million out of the 2.5 million podcasts out there on Apple Podcasts only – most of them aren't even active. People got real inspired to start something back in 2019, 2020 when the shit hit the fan and they didn't get the results that they were looking for because it's much, much harder now. Chris just alluded to, if you look back in 2013 or 2014 as a top 100 podcast, there are all these unknown names. You look at the top 100 right now, it's all big media. There are no unknown names in the top 100 anymore. Everybody is a big player. And that makes it very, very difficult and, in a way, disappointing for the independent creator because they can't get the traction that they want to get. And so now the creators have to look at what they're doing a lot differently. They have to adjust their expectations. Everybody has those JRE delusions of grandeur when they start out. And it's it's been difficult over the last couple of years to pop that bubble to go, look, man, you're you're not going to be Joe Rogan. You're not going to get 10,000 downloads per episode. Just And 10,000 doesn't sound like a lot to a lot and, of people. And Rogan is getting millions. Yeah, you know, multiples of millions per down, per uh, per episode. And 10,000 now, 10, that's a lot. massive for an independent podcaster. So Apple only has 500,000 active podcasters? Per, per the classification. And then Spotify is the other one, right, Larry? Yeah, Spotify takes it to another level included. because- that's that's only and those overlap. numbers are only on Apple Podcasts. So if you open that up to Spotify and, and you YouTube. open it up to Google and you open it up to YouTube, there's well over four million podcasts that are out there. And I don't know the active stats on that. I bet you're not a lot more though. Probably maybe seven hundred fifty thousand, uh, maybe a million max, right? I think you're still looking at that twenty percent margin right there. Yeah, across of, the board, of active. Right. So I, I think that's consistent. Now, do you, do you see them all heading up? And this is for both of you. Do, you. do you see all of them growing, or do you see one or two growing and the others kind of left behind? You're talking about platforms? Yeah, because, I mean, there's a gazillion. gazillion. You got, what, Truth Now, you got the Patreon. Oh, he's you talking got about the social. Just uh, all everything all together. You know, you know what I mean? You're going to YouTube. have your hits and misses. I mean, everybody's everybody's coming out with their platform these days. I mean, there, there's you got Fireside. You, you had Clubhouse for a while. You've got um, uh, Twitter Spaces. You got, well, I think it's Spotify had the Green. 
green room or whatever it was. And all of these places were trying to capture what they called social audio. And it's, that's a little bit different than podcasting, but a lot of folks were using that same environment to quote unquote podcast from too. And that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier in that the term podcast has evolved. You know, it used to mean one thing, audio only, and it had to be distributed via RSS. Now a podcast is just a, it's just a show. You know, I don't even consume audio only podcasts. I only consume podcasts on YouTube. I want to see what the hell's going on. I want the video. Now, I don't just sit there and stare at the screen and go, okay, I love this conversation. But if I'm doing some work, I've got that tab in the background. And if somebody starts laughing or somebody starts arguing or it gets whatever, if it piques my interest, I'm going to tab over and I want to watch what's going on. I'm a very visual kind of guy. And a lot of people are going that way. So if I had to say, which platform was going to grow the most over the next couple of years? Me personally, this is just a Larry Roberts prediction. It's YouTube. I think it'll stay, huh? Yeah, 100%. I think it's YouTube, Spotify. Apple is going to be there. I would look at Amazon too, but they're not there yet, but they would be next. Amazon's always Amazon, going to. Huh? Oh, yeah. Amazon's already playing around with stuff, but you're not going to. They're going to come out of the back door when you least expect it and start running when, when everybody's established. They're, they're doing stuff right now. Do you think the problem with Apple uh, just overall is that Tim Cook is a businessman where Steve Jobs was an innovator, and that's why nothing really has been different other than chips? I, I personally think so, yeah. Getting away from the hardware discussion at all, just from a con conceptual standpoint, I think that's at 100% because they, they're they the kings of podcasts. I mean, podcasting started on Apple Podcast, and there's something about being king. You tend to get complacent. You tend to just accept the fact that you're the king and everybody's coming to me and I'm still. And, and if you look at it, when you launch a podcast, they still make the rules. They still set the character limits on all the fields that are available to describe the podcast or title the podcast. They still set all the categories for podcast. There's 110 different categories where you can put your podcast. Apple says which ones those are. So they're still leading the way. And that's probably not going to change for a while. I didn't realize how big they were, Rob, until I was talking to Chris. This whole Apple podcast shit is it's huge, way bigger than I thought it was. I thought it was just like dead. And then after talking to you, I, Chris, think, I was, think about how wow. big that universe is. And Steve Jobs started when 04 or 05. Mm. We're almost 17 years yeah. later, and it's still current. The guy's dead since when? 2015? And you got Tim Cook running it. Just, and Tim Cook is still running. He's, yeah. yeah. And it's still there. It's a pretty amazing for tech for that to be still what current. I, but I think the most amazing thing is what you just said. And every podcaster needs to hear what you just said. You thought it was dead. I thought it was dead. You didn't even give it a consideration. And I didn't pay attention to and it at all. that's what we're going to be seeing as things evolve because everybody's going to YouTube. Everybody's going to Spotify. YouTube makes things so much easier for a show to develop. And I just called it a show instead of a podcast intentionally because we're kind of getting away from the term podcast. That's an Apple centric term. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and again, it's become synonymous with so many different things. Well, go click the link in, in uh, Spotify. The link to your podcast is show. It's slash show. Yeah. Slash episode. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, TV you just show. said, yeah. yeah. But I, I re and right. Yeah. That's Chris. He goes, uh, so what's your Apple downloads? I said, I said to him, I said, I don't even fuck with the Apple. And then he was like, well, you need to start to mess with Apple. And I was like, why? Right? Yeah, most people don't look. So you're, you're still missing an audience. And I would highly recommend that you, you, you branch out and you get on Apple as well. But again, it just, it, it, that just resonates with me so hardcore that you said you didn't even think it was a thing. Not until three months ago, four months ago. Yeah. No, well, didn't yeah. even pay attention. They've yeah. basically, they basically taken, like I watch um, you know, ESPN a lot, right? Sports guy. And ESPN's taken, like, because no one's really watching TV anymore. Right, right. But ESPN still has all this content. NFL, MLB, NBA, all this type of stuff. The problem that I have with it is, and I have some guys that I, I, I really follow, but there's, like, every guy that's a reporter there, or a news reporter, now has a podcast. <laughs> Bet, and it's just, yeah. like, it's too goddamn much. Like, there's some good ones, and then there's just junk. But it's just ESPN has all this money, so they're throwing out all all these podcasts and I guess see what sticks basically. Will this stick? Will this stick? Oh, that didn't stick. You're out. But it's just too much when that comes to that type of stuff. CNN, I know they tried their thing, remember? Oh, uh, CNN. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, they had CNN Plus. That, oh, you know, yeah. You know the Daily Wire has almost a million subscribers? Really? Yeah. Yeah, they're crushing it. Bringing in well over 100 million a year. Articles, now, especially, stuff. well, both both of you guys in, in this. How about that CNN Plus shit? They spent three. First of all, nobody million, was yeah. even really watching it anyway, and then right. they, and then they tried to charge. 
It, it's just arrogance. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pure arrogance. Do you know? Do you know if they got to ten thousand subscribers? I think they hit ten thousand. I don't think, think about they did. That. For three hundred million, though, that's a that's yeah. They, they Rob Google how yeah. many uh, subscribers did CNN Plus get? I don't even think how, they is got ten thousand. Three thousand times ten thousand is that three hundred million? Because that's what they. I mean, we they, can do they, a better conversion. Million, you give me, and that's what they're telling you. Put all the zeros up, and Larry. Figure that, um, Larry. They're what? telling us they spent three hundred million. Yeah, they're yeah. Telling. That's all they're. More, that, right? That's all they're disclosing. Half a million. Yeah. They don't, and they don't have the my pillow guy every every two seconds, you know. <laughs> he's, he's not he's not selling that rock on the side to fucking pay for those commercials. You know what she spent in fucking commercials? Like no, how much? Yeah. They say he's the top media buyer. I, in the oh, world. I think we looked it up, Rob. What did like four hundred million last year in in, in ads? Yeah, in commercials. You yeah, yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Who's, yeah. Who's that? Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the pillow guy. Yeah. Yeah, the my pillow or whatever. I thought it was like forty million. I didn't know it was four hundred million. CNN Plus struggles Drawing fewer view. than 10 oh, 10,000 <laughs> daily viewers Which means that's not How many subs they had Yeah They probably let a bunch free Yeah You're right It probably was yeah. a thousand subs Yeah <laughs> <laughs> they spent three hundred million dollars. That's they, insane. They probably comp like five thousand people. I guarantee it. it. I guarantee it. Someone got fired. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's all smoke and mirrors. You know. But it just shows that you, you can even have a, a well established brand. Granted, CNN's got a lot of shit over the past few years, but you can still be a well established brand and still fall flat on your face. So if you can see a brand like that fall flat on its face in its efforts to launch a podcast or launch a social audio audio platform. Imagine how hard it is for the independent creator to do it. There you go. Yeah. And that's when you come in. Yeah. That's when you step yeah. in, you know, yeah. because then you don't make the mistake like we did with getting the blues. Yeah, you don't, don't you don't work. name your podcast readily random. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> And then have to redirect it to what you really want yeah. it to be, but you already have it established since fifteen. Yeah. Right? So yeah. You it's, have it's it's a bitch. Let's just you, do it right, you right were out of the saying gate. That, and then on scene, I'm like, what the fuck is it redirected? But you know, I, I get it. I, yeah. I, that, that's really cool. So you're known as as an attention getter. A little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah. Chris, g give me two things about him. What what does he do that grabs it when he's well, speaking first, or whatever? The first thing is where where's the red hat? I was going to ask that earlier. What is he's what known is red as red hat? hat Larry? You know that, right? Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah, yeah, he's got an NFT coming out for the hat. Why red? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's it's funny because it, 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 it came out of insecurities, to be honest with you. Because uh, again, I mentioned I was born in '72, so I turned 50 in six weeks from today. I turned 50 August 30th. You so, mean 30? Uh, no, 50. I was trying to help you out. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. <laughs> so in, in an effort to, to speak to the younger generations, which are a lot of the creators, I thought I need to wear, you know, a younger brand. So I had a, a Supreme hat, you know, just that brand Supreme. It was cool five years ago. Yeah, not so cool now. They've yeah. kind of fell off. So but I, I, I was that idiot who spent the 120 for the T-shirt. Yeah. Well, I spent uh, whatever the 120 <laughs> for the hat. Right? Okay, all uh, right. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> uh, so I'm on stage. I, I, I gave a, a presentation at PodFest. It was last November. So this is really this speaks to how powerful branding can actually be. Just in the short amount of time, I've become known for the red hat. So I gave the presentation. I was wearing the Supreme hat. I come down off stage. Gentleman by the name of Alex Sanfilippo. I drop his name every chance I get because he changed my world just with his suggestion. He goes, hey, bro, why are you giving Supreme all this love? And I told him the whole story, just trying to relate to the kids, those wacky kids and their brands and all that shit. And he goes, well, are they sponsoring you? I go, no, dude, I'm fucking 50. They're not going to sponsor me. He goes, well, then why are you wearing their shit? I said, okay, you make a valid point. He goes, just get a red hat and just wear a red hat if red's your color. And red really wasn't my color. I'm more of a blue guy, to be honest with you. I like blue. But anyways, it was red. So I got home that night. I threw, threw away the $120 hat, went to Amazon, bought a $6 <laughs> <laughs> unbranded red hat, and it just took off from there. And it actually and fits better than the fucking Supreme It does too. fit a little bit better than the Supreme hat. Yeah. Supreme hat was a little big for my, you know, my head. But... Because I think I couldn't find the size, you know, I had yeah. to go up one size. But anyways, whatever. Well, they only made ten of them. Remember? Yeah, well, and then they charge us a gazillion dollars. And I think I bought mine on StockX, so it probably was fake on top of that. So, so <laughs> thank China again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyways, I started wearing the red hat, and man, just the recognition took off immediately. And as I mentioned before, I've been all over the country this year. I was at Bitcoin Miami back in when was that? April, May, whatever. Thirty-five thousand people in attendance. Over those three days, multiple people spotted me in the crowd people i didn't even know that walked up to me and go dude i spotted you because of the red hat i met you at podfest or i saw you at podfest or whatever i saw you over here i saw you over there and it was the red hat that made me stand out in front of thirty-five thousand other people and it's just become the moniker i was doing a presentation a virtual presentation a while back and 
while I was doing the presentation, the chat blew up. And I didn't even know this was going on. I was just doing my presentation. And they had taken a red hat and put it on a cat because the chat had called me <laughs> had called me Cool Cat Larry. He's so cool, whatever. And they were kind of making fun of me, which is cool. But they were doing it in, in fun. So they put together this image of a cat with a red hat and my uh, my glasses that you'll find me in other pictures. It's not the ones I'm wearing today, but they're kind of some Run DMC type frames because I'm still old school. Uh, and they gave him a wad of cash and they called it Cool Cat Larry. And I'm like, holy shit man this is really taken off and you see it online you see it at conferences i'm the red hat guy uh podfest was just a couple of months ago and because of the red hat it was it was pretty crazy it was it was something that i had never really experienced before but i mean i couldn't go well, you stood out yeah you i stood, stood out. out what's another one and, 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 well he says where who says that? I mean, motherfucker right let the where let the h go he won't let that go let right? the h go. Never, have you ever heard that Someone pronounce the H? But what's fucked up is my kid gives me shit for it, too. My son gives me shit for it. Where? Yeah. He goes, he he doesn't see that. It's one of a kind. Where? I don't Fuck, it's spelled W-H-E-R-E. That's how it's spelled. I don't know what to tell you. But he's a a good man, and you wear the same outfit, which helps because he brands. Right. Yeah, I mean that's, that's important. That's all it is. Marketing, that's all it is. He's consistent. You know? Do you when when you're speaking, do you have a particular opening that, that you use to grab based on the crowd that you're in front of. Like, if you know this is kind of a, uh, I'll say it, not you, like a snobby crowd. Yeah. Like, would you have a different opening to grab attention with them? If you have a more younger crowd, lax crowd, or you just go off the cuff? Like, how do you go about it? A a lot of it's trying to judge the audience. And I've I've gotten to where I'm a lot better at judging audiences, you know, through doing the comedy and and flip Failing, failing miserably, uh, you you can see when an audience is going to react a certain way, and you can kind of feel that energy. And at a lot of these conferences where I'm speaking, I have the opportunity to be involved in the crowd before I even go up, so I have an idea of what their re- reception is going to be. Uh, and most of the time, I talk about podcasting. Other times, I talk about branding, and sometimes I tell my personal story, and I tell it a lot different than the way that I shared it here. So depending on the message that I'm conveying with that particular talk, it determines how I'm going to, going to open it. I mean, if I'm there to talk about recovery and I'm there to talk about my story, of course, that's a more somber, uh, a more focused, and, and more direct approach than what I'm going to be using if I'm going to be talking about branding. If I come out, I come out and I'm talking about branding, it's going to be silliness right off the bat. I'm going to be loud, and I'm I'm going to be aggressive and I'm going to be flailing and you're going to see me moving and, and, and speaking in a totally different tone with a totally different stage presence about me. So it just varies from talk to talk. So now somebody who, who's getting into speaking, well, what, what's a couple of tips that you would give them being that, you know, you're, you've been doing it now that when they want to grab attention, you know, read the crowd. We got that. Yeah. Give three tips like based on crowd that you look for that you say, okay, this crowd isn't going to be into fuck. Right, right. right. Or this crowd is going to be into fuck. Right. Well, one of the primary things is to make sure that you draw the crowd in. I do crowd work regardless of what the talk is. I do crowd work to a certain degree with every crowd. And the other thing is to make sure that you make eye contact with different people in the crowd at different angles. So many times speakers come up and they get right here and they they, they stare straight out into the crowd and they don't bring the audience in. They don't engage with the audience. They That's just give their tip. talk. That's a good tip because I've been to shit like that and they don't look around. like It's just they're like this. Yeah. 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 Now, my speaking coach, I get shit all the time because I move around the stage too much. But I like to make eye contact. Yeah. I like to bring everybody in. I like people. To, I like to engage with people on the on the fiftieth row as compared to the first row. I mean, I, I like them over on the. I like to make sure that everybody's engaged in in the talk. The other thing is is practice. You know, it's amazing as a podcaster, people have the hardest time speaking into a microphone and looking into a camera, and just having a conversation with themselves with an audience that they can't see. I don't think I could do that. It's it, you do it every day. I, I, I would need a sidekick. I, I would have, like if I would do something like that, I'd have to have Rob. Like it, right. Like me just sitting here, I I would have no interest. It's it's well, it's extremely tough. Yeah. Because and and I've got a studio at my house, and it's a real studio. I am very similar to what you have here, floor to ceiling curtains and the whole thing. I mean, I invested a lot of money in making a studio uh, out of one of the bedrooms at my house. But the thing is. Even though it's sound treated and it sounds great in the studio, I know on the other side of the wall is our game room. That's where my wife hangs out and watches The Real Housewives and all that fun stuff. Uh, so I know what's happening is I, I sit in there. Shows. Dude, I do too. They're, they're the worst. ID channel, TLC. Yeah. You're just naming my wife's top 10 list. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what she watches. So, But I know that when I'm in the studio and I'm recording by myself and I'm staring into the logo of that Canon M50. You don't have to hear the ID channel? Uh, I, don't, I, I can't hear it from, <laughs> from the wall because she knows when I'm recording to turn it down. Please. But I know she can hear me because I'm loud as fuck. 
So I know that when I'm in there talking to myself and I'm creating content by myself, I just know she's on the other side of the wall just laughing her fucking ass off going, that idiot, that dork is in there Uh, doing his shit again. So it's hard to overcome that. So when I first started doing this, I would do the same thing. I'd kind of look at the camera and I would just barely speak audibly just so that I could kind of get out what I'm saying. But I wasn't into it. I wasn't creating the content. I wasn't connecting with my audience. Because you need that feedback somehow, right? Yes, but you got to get to a point where you can create that feedback yourself. So even if you get on stage and you're not getting that reaction from the crowd, because that fucking sucks when you drop a line like I dropped with you earlier when I said accidentally the whole tip and you just stared at me like I was an idiot. I'm like, that's a fucking joke, Tommy. Just fucking <laughs> la- at least smile, bro. <laughs> so it, that That's hard when you're standing in front of 20 people, 30 people, 50, 100 people. True. It's hard as shit to sit up there and a, jo- a joke not hit or a point not land and you not get any feedback. So you have to get comfortable with that. You have to get comfortable, and this sounds cheesy as shit, you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's the first step for a podcaster is to be able to get uncomfortable in your own environment, in your own home studio, in your own closet, wherever you fucking record, get uncomfortable, get in there get on that mic, get that excitement going, flail your hands, change the tone of your voice, get into what you're saying. Once you can do that in your home studio and you can do it consistently and put out content like that, you can then take that same energy and translate it to the stage. And once you can do that on stage, you'll start seeing that audience come alive. You'll start seeing that audience start to react. You'll start getting that engagement. You'll get that applause at your applause breaks. That's the other thing, take breaks. So many times people get up there and they start talking and they just talk and they just wanna go through all their slides and they wanna go through their presentation and they go, thank you. And they're out. Yeah. And they're out. Yeah, yeah I think, I, I, Tom, we, Tommy talked about this, I think you can do it. I mean. I had to do it because I went to school to do that. Walk, talk on stage, public speaking, look at people like you said in the eye. I like to move like you do. Move yeah, around yeah. The stage. Go to this person over here, go to that person, go to this person. And if you fuck up, you make a joke of yourself. Oh, my God. You guys didn't get that joke. It, he could do it. He could do it. Tommy will do it. I mean, just the hey, other yeah, night. Yeah, we'll get him on stage. <laughs> just, just the other night I was doing a presentation, and I was about four slides in. My fucking clicker stops working. It's a brand new fucking clicker with a brand new battery. Uh, so I have not, no not, idea. Now, how do you seem, seamlessly adjust when that fucking clicker doesn't work? I, I learned the biggest lesson on how to do this Two or how not to pocket? do it. <laughs> no. I still, I ended up having to go to my laptop and I would transition and hit the the return the enter key and change my slides with the enter key. But you have to do it in a way that doesn't draw so much attention Natural. to it. Yeah. yeah. I did a showcase at the Addison Improv because I, I took gotcha. a comedy class and did a showcase there and I wasn't ready for a showcase. <laughs> I was standing there on stage and of course it happens to me I'm standing there doing my set. The fucking mic cable falls out of the mic. Oh. And I'm like, bad day. It falls off the stage onto the floor. And I don't know how to react to that. I'm sitting there in front of a whole house, not knowing how to react. And I reacted really, really bad. I just went, fuck it. And I set the mic on the stage. And then I started to try to yell my jokes. Oh, boy. (laughs) <laughs> and that was it, it, that's not how I should have handled it. I should have just got off the stage, got the mic cable, plugged it in, and whatever. There was a much better way to handle it than what I handled it. Because, I mean, it just totally threw me out of my game. The rest of my set sucked. Not saying it wouldn't have sucked if that hadn't happened, but at least now I have an excuse as to why it sucked. But but, but that taught me a major, major lesson on how to, how to handle those types of situations and how to not handle those types of situations. So Well, the only way you learn is when you fail, right? Exactly. Exactly. It, it, th- that's the biggest teacher. But understanding that and being able to suck it up and go up there and, and take that ass whooping, that's hard for so many people. It's impossible for so many different people. It's like we go back to when we were talking earlier. I went to that, that the train with those guys and I got knocked out the first night. But yet I still came back. That's going to happen. That's going to happen on your podcast. Your podcast, you're going to launch it. It's going to fall flat on its fucking face. You're going to get five downloads. It's going to happen. But you still have to keep creating. You have to keep coming back. You have to stay consistent with it. And eventually, you're going to find your footing. You're going to find your audience. But you got to let that mic cable fall out from time to time time, and learn those lessons before you know how to react appropriately. Or they just don't love it and find a new career. Well, that happens, too, because they expect those overnight results. Again, they go, we go back to those delusions of grandeur. They think if they release it, they're going to come. This ain't Field of Dreams, okay? <laughs> if you make a podcast, they ain't going to fucking listen. you got to do more than that. Like when did you notice Podcast Magazine? When, when, when did you first see that? The magazine? Yeah. Was it a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think it came onto the scene a couple of years ago. Yeah, because that's Podcast Magazine is a magazine that came out. Who was on the cover? Was it Joe Rogan? I they honestly put some don't big remember. Name on in the beginning. 
I don't, I don't remember who was the first one. And then it took off. Yeah, there you go. Steve Ulster started it, right? Yeah, Steve Ulster started it. He's the owner of Podcast Magazine. And now you edit this, right? I do not edit. I have nothing to do with Podcast Magazine. You have nothing to do with Podcast Magazine? Nothing. Uh, 40 now, now, I will say this. I do have one thing to do. And uh, I was just nominated and awarded uh, top 40, over 40 influencers in the podcast space. I, I did make that list. So, uh, And that's a Podcast Magazine list. So I, I am listed in Podcast Magazine as one of the most influential 40 over 40 podcasters. 40 over 40. The yeah. 40 creator, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you elaborate on that? So it's uh they just pick creators forty over forty. So he's one of the top guys in there, and uh, he was That's picked. Awesome. So this will you know, I mean, it's he'll a, be celebrated as one of the top forty over forty creators. And what do you think it was about you that got you in that top forty? Like, the red what, hat. It was more than the red. It, hat. No, it was the fucking red hat. You think no, it was just the no, fucking I, red I, hat? Really? No, I don't think it was the red. I mean, the red hat definitely contributed. But you know, I get a lot of shit for talking about the red hat so much, but it's done so much. Uh, but I think too, it's just it, it, I've been in the game now for eight years. Uh, I, I again, I speak on stages across the country, and I've started to kind of get a bit of a following as far as being the podcast producer to work with out there. So uh, I enjoy helping people. I don't know how I got nominated. I don't know how I got chosen. You didn't lobby for it, right? They just told you. Yeah, I had yeah. no idea. I had nothing to do with it. So uh, they just they, oh, they just told. You. I just got an email wow. that said, "Hey, congratulations! You've been selected as one of the top forty over 40. So I, how the background works, I really don't know. But it's just somebody saw something that said, "Hey, let's make this guy." That uh, makes it even nominate. more. Impressive, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, it's not like I lobbied for it or bought it or whatever. You know, a lot of times they say if you, to make these lists, you got to buy your way on it. I didn't buy shit. I didn't spend a dime on it. So, congratulations. Uh, yeah, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, now, where where do you see Elon? Did you see uh, Elon lost today on the delay? Did you see that? Yeah, but we'll see what happens. But it still moves forward, right? The court thing with Twitter? Yeah, like, well, he wanted to delay it to get more information, you know, to build up more information to go to court with them, and they denied it. I think I think all of it's all going to come out in Discovery in court anyways, don't you think? I don't know. What do you well, think? Well, that's what he was saying in a tweet. I mean, you know, there's a meme floating around out there where he, he puts his bid in, wants to see more information, they deny it, now they have to expose it in court. How so, many bots do I mean, you think Twitter's running? Oh, a shit ton. I think the vast majority. I don't have you a number like 50%, by any means. like 50%? Like uh, if you were no, to guess? higher. Higher. You think it's higher? Higher. Uh, what do you I, think, Tommy? I think 65, 70. Yeah, I think 70% so too. 70% bots. Yeah. Huh? I, yeah. I, I think, it, I think wow. when, when- 100%. I think when the when Elon goes in here, I think you're going to see 60 to 70, if what? not more. How yeah. did they get away with that kind of fraud? Because the people are buying ads on bots. Well, it's it, well, <laughs> right. Am I, I not mean, right? Isn't that fraud? Straight I, I, up I fraud? don't know how to have this conversation without getting overly political about it. But I mean, it, there's there's a whole lot behind there that it's. I mean, it's it's really just a political tool these days. See now, what worries me about this is right. Any other, in my opinion. Any other judge would have granted a delay because Twitter lied like hell. He proved that they lied oh, yeah. like hell for. Yeah. He already proved what 30, 30 million. It was a shit ton. I don't have the a number off the top of my head. Yeah. So he proved enough fact that they're lying, right? Yeah. We would all agree with that. For, for the for sure. For, for, yeah. For more any, than for enough. anybody else out there, he provided more than enough information. Okay. So now for that judge to know that that Elon proved he's yeah. not saying he's proving yeah. that there's 30 million or more fake accounts and the judge denies him a delay yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and what you call it in court is a continuance so he yeah. has more time for him and his lawyers to get shit together yeah what do i think immediately well, I'm the thinking government's that, involved yeah i'm thinking the same thing there's no fucking judge well, on this a, planet that would not give that there's that money involved somebody's wasn't taking there an out wasn't there like a twitter outage the other day too and everybody's like what the fuck's that about like so you couldn't get on twitter it happened the other day. Is that it? So they're thinking something's going on. Like they're fucking How around. How many users are on Twitter? 300 million? Do you guys know the uh, number? I don't even- That they I, say so, so-called users. I, I have an account on Twitter, but I don't use it. So I, I, I know I Google, uh, Facebook's like over a billion, but Twitter's what, yeah, what three, four hundred million? I don't know. Yeah. He, he's going to go. But, but see- That means you only have like 60, 50 million real accounts. The rest, 200 and whatever, are probably fake. Yeah, I, I'd buy that for I, I, I would I'd buy that in a heartbeat. And because think if you do that, right, it's going to bump you up in the algorithm, right, for a period of time. And even if it doesn't, Twitter's a no name, right? So you just go and you're going to see active. You so know, then users. the bots yeah. were used to boost up whatever they wanted, right? Well, yeah. So if their left is can left be, so whatever is left, they're going to shoot the bots to the left, and then that goes up. Well, haven't you seen yeah. 150 million active users? So let's just say if Tommy's number's right, 60 million off the top, 
Okay, wait, wait. Let's make sure my numbers right now. Go how, put in how many uh, bots did Elon Musk find on Twitter, right? Because then, then, we got 450 there, so there's no way in hell they got. Wow. No. What do you? I bet you that. I bet you they got what a hundred thousand, a hundred million, maybe. He said it's more like twenty percent. So yeah, about a hundred million of those are fake. <sighs> that's a lot. That's a lot, huh? Is that what he just said? He yeah, said. Yeah, I can't find it on here, but it's he a, said twenty percent. Twenty percent, yeah. Twenty percent. You have to subscribe to i guarantee it's higher than that and he would prove that if he had more time well if he's saying 20 percent now in my opinion he knows that it's 20 percent. but he's he wanted more time to dig to prove that maybe it's 15 percent. yeah you know what i mean well that's what i'm saying they said that the other day there was a this outage and it was like a f- few hours too it wasn't like yeah it went off like no one could access twitter and it kind of went hush but i heard about it. i'm like that's very interesting it goes that no one like off the off, no one can log on to Twitter. What would be the reason for them to do that? The only thing I could think is like mess with some type of code and yeah, they, some, they can't do it. it sound like they got time. they're doing something behind the scenes. It's fucking crazy. Yeah, they're cleaning shit. something up. <laughs> yeah, trying. Just to, like they're I making sure that percentage <laughs> goes I mean, down it, for court. It, it yeah, could have just been a DDoS. I'm telling you though, that's <laughs> that's it, exactly they own the, I mean, they own the cards, right? It I mean, could have just been a DDoS attack of some sort. I don't though, know. You know. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's just too, to, uh, it's too, what do you call it? Too perfect. Time. Too I coincidental. Mean, yeah. yeah. Too coincidental. To yeah. try to play Elon Musk. I mean, you really got to. Y- yeah. Uh, you really got to be really fucking stupid. <laughs> I think what well, I, I think uh, him and Jack Dorsey were going to team up and I think Dorsey was going to run it. And I think Elon was going to be in the background because I think the board just beat Dorsey out of it. Oh, I, yeah. I don't think Dorsey yeah. ever wanted it to be the way that it was. If anything, I think he wanted it to be like. The censored Twitter and then a non-censored Twitter, so you would have the option to go yeah, either. Yeah, yeah. Then I thought Elon would buy it, you know, not censor it, and have Jack Dorsey do what he actually wanted to do. So do you think that he'll end up buying it? Like, in at the end of the day, does he own it? I don't know. That's a great question. I don't think so. What do you think, Larry? I think he will. I think he'll end up with it. And But my, my question is, though, why do they want to force the issue? That's what I don't understand. Why do they want to force what? Why do they want to force him to buy it? Well, they want to force him. That's a fucking yeah, really a good, good question. question. Why that would is a good to, question. That's a fucking hell of a question. Yeah, that's that's a, $44 billion, I get they cash out. but Yeah, besides the cash. And they probably that, put a poison pill in there to mess him up anyways, right? Something. He would be ahead of that, though. But there, there's got to be a reason why. Yeah, I, I don't understand why they want him to buy it. He well, could start his own social platform for cheaper. Yeah, but for the, but the, the, the odds of success are much higher on a, on a pre-existing platform. I know, but with this brand, you don't think he could ever just take 20, 30 million of these guys over there? No, I don't think so. I don't, no? think, I don't think he'd pull uh, that many. I don't think so. I either. think he could clean this up a lot easier than he could starting a brand new one. How many kids does he have? They, the report six? came out and got another. I don't even some other lady. Six or came. seven. I, he I had five boys with one. I was surprised he banged Johnny Depp's girl. I didn't know he banged. Yeah, did you know I didn't either. Yeah, you know that, that yeah. was in the trial. No, I know, I know. He was the. Yeah, he, I was the whole, <laughs> dude. I was a sucker <laughs> for that trial. With the other girl, with the other actress, they were. They were Who? Up, him and two girls. It was yeah. him and uh, Amber really? and uh, I forgot the actress. I, 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 I couldn't believe when I heard Elon. I'm <laughs> there was just a shirtless, shirtless picture of him. Somebody got his on vacation somewhere. Elon. God bless him. He is the whitest person I've ever seen. That guy works indoors all day. I mean, <laughs> white, no, white, way like I'm white, way white. I mean, look at me on that screen right there. Dude, I, I, you can't see where my face starts. Is, the background ends. His I mean. skin is the color of the white background. Dude, on that yeah, thing. I, I'm, I'm right there with him. Rob, you think he buys it? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think. So. I don't know. I, you, you, I don't think he if is. If you don't have the users, you, you can't make your money back too. Forty-four billion is a lot of money for. But, but what are they willing? Weren't they willing to take something, or they want their forty-four billion? Yeah, they want the forty-four. Well, then that's why they want Elon to buy. I bet you he'll buy it for twenty-five billion or right. thirty billion. He won't buy it for forty-four. Well, then that's why they want him to buy it. They that's want, what they're arguing over. Yeah. Time. Well, well, that, well, we that's have our answer. The reason why they want him to buy, it, I thought that he had gotten them down to twenty something. But if, if if it's still at forty-four, well, yeah, the reason why they want him to buy it is they want the forty-four million and the the cats out of the box that they're full of shit. Right now, with the tech, uh, with everything going down, it's probably worth ten billion on the market now. If they dumped it, yeah. maybe less, probably less. I, I just, I just don't. If strategically, it doesn't make sense to me. I know financially it makes perfect sense, but strategically, it doesn't make sense to me. For Elon, for them to force Elon to buy it. No, they're forcing Elon to buy it at forty-four billion based uh, on bots. 
That's I, why they I, won I, him. I understand that. But you're, you're saying, saying with from the, the wall. information warfare, but, but, yeah, you for control the, for the, the cards. Why would you want to give exactly? The I mean, like, uh, that's that's their platform. I mean, they they do everything. Why, why you want to give you know your Trojan horse to yeah the, to the company? That's what I. That's that's the part I don't get. I mean, I understand the financial side of it. But, and yeah, all but that, no, but. It, it's the hats out of the box. The hats out of the box. But so many of them don't believe that. You know. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't I, I don't know either. There, there's definitely a fucking good reason, but we we're just, yeah. we don't, we don't have a figure. I'm sure it's some way deep political reason that we don't know, but I bet you Elon knows. Oh, I'm sure and he does. We'll find yeah. out. We'll yeah. find out whenever that happens. I hope he buys it. It's gonna let me down. How how good would that be? Now, how good do you think? Now, I think it would be great for podcasting, but I, you guys. They say if he buys, he's gonna integrate podcasting into Twitter, which would be game changing, and now, video too. Yeah. Wow. Now. For you who like YouTube, do you think if he did that and, you know, made Twitter podcast with video, do you think that would give YouTube a run for its money? Eventually it probably would, but it's going to take a while for it to get there because YouTube's so far ahead of the game already. I mean, they've got a director of podcasting on staff uh, and he's got major, major plans for the platform and integrating podcasting as a service into YouTube as well. Um, so th he'd have a lot of catching up to do and it's going to take years to get there. Do you... This is for both of you. Do you guys see podcasting entering the metaverse area? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything's entering the metaverse. Yeah. yeah. I'm starting to realize that more and yeah. more and more. Now, now, how would that happen? How does that affect everything? If, if podcasts are now in the metaverse, how does that affect everything else? It just gives you another opportunity to interact with your audience directly. Because you don't have to be at a conference. You can create a conference within the metaverse unless you're like me and you get motion sickness from the damn Oculus. So then I'm a struggle <laughs> there. Really? Dude, I get sick bad. I, I mean, like I've a bitch. I've never even used them. It's, it's, yeah, you can get really sick. It's terrible, bro. I mean. <laughs> why, why, why do you mean? It, there, there's a certain type of motion sickness. I think it's called perceived motion sickness. And you get that inside whenever you're using the Oculus. Um, I don't get it in environments where you're essentially standing still. So if you go through like the tutorial for the Oculus, you do things like picking up virtual blocks and dancing with a virtual robot. That kind of shit's cool. But when I'm in, in a, an environment, like there's a Jurassic Park game that I have on my Oculus. And as I'm running through the laboratories being chased by dinosaurs and hiding and shit, I perceive that I'm moving because you're in this 3D environment, but yet my body is stationary. You know, I'm sitting in a chair running through this place or whatever. And it's that perceived motion that confuses my weak little mind and I get nauseous. I get the worst headache ever and it lasts for about six hours. Wow. So I, I bought the Oculus, bought a couple games. I've probably used it four times. And now it's just sitting in a drawer. My wife's like, there's another 600 bucks you just wasted. Good <laughs> So So I'm like, shut up. But no, I, I, I still think it's going to be a major, major impact on content and content creation over the next couple of years. I mean, it's still going to take time for everybody to get involved. Um, not just because of my little wimpy perceived motion sickness, but that affects a lot of people. I've had a lot of conversations about it, and it's very common for people to experience that for their first time in the metaverse. But it brings everybody together in a way that you couldn't do before. I mean, you, you physically have virtual bodies in this place, so I can literally go and hang out with my friend. I mean, we all used to do it back in the day on AOL chat rooms. But doesn't uh, that scare you, though? To, in Does, what regard? Doesn't the metaverse scare you? That it, that it takes out human contact out of, out of Sure. Life? I mean, for the next generations coming up, uh, being the boomer that I am, it doesn't scare me in that regard, but I can definitely see where, and you're already seeing it. Shit, uh, my, it took my kid forever to get acclimated to society. My brother, my younger brother, he's still not acclimated to society, and he's only, I think, seven years younger than me. I don't even know how old he is, 40-something. <laughs> and, I mean, he, he was a video game kid coming up. He never came out of his bedroom. So I've already seen that happen. Now, for us to see it with an on Oculus a large scale. on a large scale and a virtual scale where you actually can have that virtual girlfriend and Scare, all that kind right? of shit. Yeah, it's it's freaky as hell. And you're going to find yourself with some very interesting, we'll call them, social dynamics or lack of social dynamics because people aren't going to know how to interact. You're waiting for the porn to come out. <laughs> I'm not waiting, bro. Sorry to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mess with the uh, metaverse a lot? No, I mean, I know about it, and I'm looking into it for my wife's meditations because they have metaverse meditation rooms for people to relax. But like he said, it's the young kids. If you walk a neighborhood and you see a little kid in the in the driveway, they usually have Oculus, and they're just playing around. Yeah. That's the future. They, they're not going to be doing what we did. They're plugged in. So if you're looking at – if you want to be a creator 10 years from now, or you and I were talking about, like, kid-friendly content, it should be built into the metaverse – 
with that in mind because now you're the first, you know, to do cartoons that in, in the, the metaverse, metaverse, right? So right. these kids with the Oculus, they find you first, just like I was telling you. You don't have to be great. You just have to be first and decent. And next thing you know, millions of people watching. Interesting. Well, it's like uh, you've had Mark Savant on your show before. Mark yeah. and I have been working together or talking about working together and doing podcasting in the metaverse. So that's something that he and I have been planning out. We haven't pulled the trigger on it yet, but the discussion's there, and it's something that we do plan are on the, doing. Are the capabilities there to do it right now? Yeah, to a certain degree, yeah. I mean, you could definitely have events, and people can come and join you in these events, and you could do it right there in the metaverse. Uh, I, he was actually talking about doing a presentation at PodFest in the metaverse. I mean, that was a, a planned talk. It didn't end up happening, but it was in the planning stages, and we're in that same space now. So hopefully before too long, Mark and I will get together and we'll do something. So, Do you think that ends up being incorporated? Incorporated sooner than later in uh, Podfest. Yeah, we were already on it. We we You're have, on top of yeah, that. Yeah, we already had this past year, so we're 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 watching every bit of it. Do you think anybody could could take out like the metaverse? Do you think Apple could come out with the Apple verse and just bury them? Well, the person that's trying to own it is Zuckerberg with his Oculus because he owns the hardware. And then he changed everything to Meta. Right. That yeah. Was, that was yeah. a heavy move. So he's telling you where he's going. The challenge with the metaverse, it's so big and there's so many different worlds and they're building plumbing to bridge them together. I just don't know if any one person can own it. So you think it'll be kind of like a YouTube where you have a main like a main YouTube and then you have other outlets? I think the, or... the easiest thing to think of the metaverse, it's like the Marvel universe where everything is a realm. So a metaverse is a skin. So there's multiple skins in that realm that you could visit. So it's a lot more... Like, you could have a metaverse where people could sit in here and watch us do this podcast live. Right. But there's only nine seats. Right. Then there could be a metaverse where there's people on the next skin watching those people in here. And you charge for each level. So it's really, um, the more I learn, it's very, like, y your mind is blown at the possibilities. Yeah. Because now it's like, you're talking about, like, y you like this stuff. It's like astronomy. It's like galaxies and different worlds. You're building different worlds virtually within technology. Do you think anybody could take them out? And, no, and, and I, I, at this stage, I don't. I, I don't even see anybody out there with the potential to do it. I don't even see anybody nipping at their heels and all you honesty. Don't, you don't think Apple could? I, I'm not saying they couldn't. Not with uh, what's his name at the helm, right? I agree with no, that. No, because they don't. They don't have you that. Like that an Elon Musk thinking. Musk yeah, the, yeah. You you would need a you, you would need somebody else in charge. Tim Cook's not going to do it. No. Um, but and again, it would still take time. Like Chris was saying, being the first one there, that establishes a precedence. And you're the cat daddy. You're the, you're the one that's already established the foundation. You're running the shit. And anybody else is going to have to get past you to make that progress. And it's a very very uphill. Here's climb. my prediction on the metaverse. It's going to take off. And what's happening now is people are hiring people in other countries to play games so they can make money. And they're creating guilds. Okay. People are not going to have kids pretty soon because they're going to be tied into this system. It's a, what was it, Demolition Man? Remember that? Like they, they, yeah, it was the Demolition Man. The movie okay, that was with, a good prediction. Yeah, they were having yeah. sex with playing. 1,000%. Uh, their brains were linked up. Yeah, yeah. So population is going to go off a cliff and eventually will probably go extinct um, sooner than we think. We're, we're already seeing a massive decline in birth rates. Yeah. I mean, it's happening. You've got to see it in the, in the developing world, which will happen over time yeah. because they're going to get roped into all this. Yeah. Yeah. And then either artificial intelligence will take over or there'll be like, you know, a little colony of some people in the Amazon. They're still living. And that's it. That's the last group of human beings. Hey, Rob, look up uh, the birth rate, how much yeah. the birth rate has dropped. This, yeah, this I, conversation got positive all of a sudden. I'm with you. I'm I, saying, if you look at it, that's no. how it's going. People are not reproducing. Yeah, we're not reproducing. They're putting shit in it. So we don't reproduce, in my opinion. 100%. And, 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 something going on with yeah, the food. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think it will come to the point, assuming that we survive, you know, uh, this whole China thing and everything. Assuming we get through this shit, right? I think, uh, I think within 200 years, the option is this. A, you merge with the robots and you have a society with them, or B, you colonize fucking Mars. What you said a couple months fun. ago. Yeah, that, that, and that, it's gonna. I think it's gonna go even. Yeah, I mean, it's, off look a at cliff. that. Look It'll at that. Go down further, I think. And that's as of two, 2020. Yeah. As of 2020. It's, so, it's I mean, gonna fucking, go down. Phew. Yeah. See if you can get a uh, 2020. 2021 or two right. A decline of almost 20 percent yeah and that's two years ago or a year that's and a half insane. ago and it can't be readily explained by change but they can't explain because they don't want to yeah. no, they can explain it. they know exactly <laughs> i know what I'm, you know what i'm saying yeah yeah it's like want... they say we have a tough time figuring out inflation yeah yeah, yeah. but They're somehow saying. a year or two ago you talk to these guys that tommy talks to they were telling you it was going to happen yeah yeah well, why they had trouble explaining now yeah 
They said it increased in 2021. Oh, okay. But it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a big increase blip. from like a year yeah, before. Yeah. Not, not, <laughs> not when you take it at five to ten years. Now, we'll take the first one. They, they must have not uh, caught that one. That, that one must have uh, uh, slipped through the, the sensor to, to, to knock that one off, right? Well, and you saw, too, that Google just, you know, the, the guy that worked at Google came out and said that, that Google had sentient AI. AI. Yeah, yeah. Now, they silenced him and said bullshit. But Did they uh, fire him? I don't know if they fired him or not. I thought they got rid of him. I, I I think they did fire him. I know they censored him and they called bullshit on it and he shouldn't have been saying that. And he they did, got he, quantum computers. Google yeah, got it. Yeah, dude. I guarantee it. And they're just collecting all that data and data. And yeah. Data and all yeah. that home shit. Yeah. You, know, you saw so that, that they were collecting with those yeah. cars? You yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah, with the, with the doing Google Maps. And he was just sucking in everybody's information. Yeah. A, friend, a friend of mine, his wife goes, oh, it was probably the thing. I go, why does he even have the capability to do that? And that's what you got to think. Like, Shouldn't have the capability to suck all your uh, secret things when the cars come around your house, all yeah. your passwords and everything. Yeah. Well, okay. your router. Th this is what's insane, and this happened yesterday. So we're sitting here, and I I bought another sauna just because oh, I've yeah, had yeah. the one that I've had forever, and I would he because he's been debating one because it's not that expensive and it's nice to put in. We're just talking about it. Yeah. And yesterday we googled something with Sam. And there's fucking saunas everywhere. Of course. And I'm sitting here. Yep. He's there. That's the new Mac. Listen encrypted, to everything. That's the the new 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 one. Yeah. Like in, encrypted beyond your balls. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> Google's so good that it just doesn't yeah, fucking matter. It, 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 they just know. I mean, it, it, you can say anything. And it's going to show up as an ad in Facebook. It's going to show up as an ad on Google. It's going to give you the top results on Google. You're going to see it everywhere if you just mention it. And I don't use Alexa or oh, I try. I, I don't when use I any found of that out shit. They're recording sledgehammer. Yeah, I don't Bang. use any of that. I don't How use an like Echo that? Dot or none of that shit. And it's still, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they're, they're going to get it one way or another. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And now we all love TikTok, and that just builds shine up even more and more <laughs> and more and more and more. I I, more. I can't I, I can't say anything about it because I, I I love the talk. You know. Yep. It, it's well, everybody it, does. I mean, even for one person is going to make a difference. Not. Fuck it with yeah. it. Yeah. They already got us. I mean, even balls. boomers like myself. I mean, my wife and I, that's how we spend time together. <laughs> yeah. I, I shit you not. We go, we get in the bed, and we spend an hour watching TikTok. I mean, it's just, it's, we got our favorites, and that's our time together. It's, yeah. So everybody. What, what do you guys watch on TikTok? Mostly animal videos. Like, what do you mean? Like cute little. Yeah, animals? cute dog videos and shit like not that. Not like tigers mauling people? No, I don't watch that shit. But... <laughs> that's what I'd be watching. No, no, no. It's usually Some guy cute... in an elephant, it's, tiger it's, jumping over. It's usually funny dog videos. I mean, because that's how we've trained the algorithm. Uh, she, You know, she's a dog freak. And I mean, I, I've got to where I love dogs. Kind of had to since I love her. I got to love dogs too, you know? Yeah, so. one of those things. Yeah. Now, so. are you into NFTs? A little bit. A little bit. Where do you, where do you stand with NFTs? He's he's pretty good. I I, I like NFTs, but he's getting into it because he's building his own NFT for Cool Cat Larry. Yeah, right. the the little Cool Cat Larry thing that's going to be an NFT. I'll be minting it actually next week when I get back. I just joined a new uh, platform that is specifically for developing NFTs in the podcasting space. So oh. I'm one of their beta testers. What's, what's the platform called? Give it, it, it's called Uncut.fm. So, and it's still coming out. It's still in the early stages, but they've developed an amazing platform specifically for podcasters to turn their podcast into NFTs, turn their episodes into NFTs and build their communities right there on the platform. How the hell do you do that? It, it, it's like building a community anywhere. And it helps if you already have an existing community. I mean, a lot of the NFTs that you see out, out there right now, a lot of those projects, they're garbage and people are jumping on board. They're going, Oh, I got to have an NFT cause I'm going to get rich. And you're not. Because it's just like anything. You have to have a community to support your, your artwork. You have to have a community to support your podcast. You have to have a community to support your YouTube channel. So they're missing the boat there. They think if I just create this artwork, they're going to buy my shit and I'm going to get rich. And that's just not how it works. But they've made it so simple on uncut.fm that now people, one of the biggest challenges with NFTs and understanding the space is people don't understand cryptocurrency in and of itself. And you have to use, generally speaking, Ethereum to buy NFTs. So people don't understand how they go from having their dollar and they convert it to Ethereum or whatever the fuck that is, right? And then use that Ethereum to buy the NFT in this random, they're calling it a wallet, but I don't put it in my back pocket. I don't know what, what the hell a wallet is. People don't understand the technology and how it works. And it's very, very intimidating. What this platform has done is allowed the independent podcasters to come in, bring their community or build their community and build out their NFTs with no knowledge of tech. People can buy NFTs on their platform with their debit card. They don't even have to know that they're making the exchange because they do the exchange for them on the back end. And I think this type of technology is going to be what's so critical to getting the mainstream public into the NFT and the Web3 space. 
it just people don't understand it. You know, I'm starting a podcast called Bitcoin Impact. And the whole point behind that podcast is to speak to people. And I don't say this to be insulting, but to speak to people on a, on a fifth grade level so that they can understand. Oh, no, no, no. We, we need kinder, kindergarten level. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I mean, if it, I mean Sam preschool. really got us yeah. on preschool level. You know, Sam was very good. We said, look, we're, we're, we're in preschool. Yeah. <laughs> can you talk to us about Bitcoin like we're preschool? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, I still don't understand the fucking mint thing with this NFT shit. I like Chris Brown. So he came out with an NFT. Right. You could buy a mint. I still don't understand what I'm buying with a mint. You're you're buying the NFT itself, so you're buying a version of that NFT, and minting the NFT is executing what is called a contract. So there's a contract that's it's basically just the uh, it's 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 the property and the rights behind the NFT when you execute that contract. Now it's yours, and you're executing that contract, making a a a an entry on the blockchain. So people go, okay, what the fuck's a blockchain? A blockchain is just a ledger. It literally just tracks every transaction that has to do with that particular NFT. And when you execute this contract or mint the NFT, it writes the record for that NFT to the ledger. But why do I have to mint it? Why can't I just buy it? It's almost is, is minting it like a GoFundMe so that they can make the NFT? Not at all, because the NFT already exists. So uh, to a degree, you, minting it is just the process of executing that contract and writing that record to the ledger or to the blockchain. So you're not necessarily doing anything. All of that happens on the background, in the background, on the on the blockchain itself. So you're not doing anything. That's just the technical term for it. So take the technical terminology away from it, and all you're really doing is buying the NFT. All of the minting takes place behind the scenes. You don't even, as a consumer, you don't even have to worry about that. But if I mint it, I don't. If I mint an NFT right now, I yes. don't get anything right now. I'm you get the minting. NFT. No, you mint it. It's yours. Okay, on this one, like you mint it now and then you get it a month later. There's certain functionality that you can build into NFTs that do a variety of different things. There's different utilities that are also built into the NFTs. The way I was talking about it there was a very, very entry level way of understanding NFTs because when they first hit the scene, most people just thought, oh, it's just a JPEG or it's just an 8-bit graphical image. You see a lot of NFTs that look like 8-bit video game to graphics. To this day, an NFT to me is just a bunch of shit put together and it could be like I like the one that Mr. Beast did, but other than that one, it's just a bunch of shit put together and it's a picture and somebody buys it and that's what it is. And there's no copyright issues. There's no nothing. Right. And to a degree, that's what it was. When it first came on the scene, we went through and we're kind of at the tail end of the collectability phase of NFTs. So back then and when they first hit the scene, that's what we were doing. People were collecting these images because it was the cool thing to do. It's like uh, wearing vintage Jordans. You're the only one that has that pair of vintage Jordans. If you have an original Jordan 4 in cement gray, you got a cat daddy pair of shoes with you right there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're the only one that has them. Nobody else Very has true. that 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 Jordan. That's essentially what NFTs were. They were collectibles. Now we're at the tail end of the collectible side of things, and people aren't buying them for the collectability as much as they were. Now we're entering into what they call the utility phase. So now, although you'll have the artistic side of an NFT, it's still a graphical representation of something. It's still a cool image, maybe a 3D hologram or whatever it may be. It's still an image of something, but behind that image, now you have utility, meaning that there's functionality and there's purpose behind owning it more so than the collectability side that we first saw two, three, four years ago when we first started hearing the term NFT. So are you, are you saying if he has a Chris Brown one, right? Yes. He has a Chris Brown NFT. Yes. Maybe the utility is attached to it. Anyone that has that NFT will get a free ticket to my concert. Exactly. Something that's, like that. That's the utility side. And that's the utility side. Yes. And that's an Good example question. of the utility side. That's and, and that's a great, great job, Rob. And are there more than one? So this is what I don't understand. We take a picture of you right now. Right. Red hat. Yep. And we do something cool, crazy shit with it. It ain't worth we're, shit. All right. <laughs> and we, we, put, we, put, we put it out there. Is it only, and we could do it a million different ways, right? You can have horns coming out. You can have a scarf around your <laughs> neck, whatever you want to do. Sure. Is there only one NFT, let's say, if devil horns coming out of your head? There's only one? Only one unique record on the blockchain for that that's NFT. It. Yes. So it's that, yes, see, that's it. Only one. Yes. Okay. I get it. Now, if I took a picture of you right now, yes. right, and yes. I made it real cool and it's you, yeah. and I make a million dollars, yes. and I don't give you anything, yes. how do you feel? You don't like care? shit. Right. So typically you have to get the rights in order to do that. You have to, it, Just like anything else, if you're going to use somebody's song, you have to buy the rights to their images. For an NFT? To, sure. 
you can't mint an Im- you can't mint an image of Michael Jordan and expect. Are you kidding me? I could pull up right now, fucking a pile of Allen Iverson. Who else do we oh, see? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a ton. and who's been at the, who's been at those? Where did we find that? I forget. Well, they were that. with the uh, yacht guy. Top shots. Might have been. I I don't know. Yeah, they didn't. Four day like, yacht club or something. Uh, fucking forty thousand, fifty thousand. They probably oh, paid him. And can you pull it up on OpenSea? I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Yep. Yeah, we'll see if you can find it. But no, I I guarantee it. Though maybe it's like a an illegal thing. But so you're telling me every time I see an Allen Iverson, a Michael Jordan, uh, Shaq, that that they contacted their people and they got the okay. I would say yes to that. Now I could I be wrong, and I'm opening myself up to a shit ton of, of judgment here, and that's fine. No, but yeah, no. So you're telling me right there, like that. Alan Iverson, all those got the rights to do that? Because that's an infamous, that's his, uh, when he, in the playoff game, when he did the ear thing to the crowd, I remember that. Yeah. That's the Jordan crossover. So there's no way that Alan Iverson, who was Has just- Has approved a, all of those. Yeah. And, he, and he's been in Turkey forever. He comes back for two weeks and leaves. And, and ours, and I, that's just one that we picked. Right, right, but right, right. you could pick any celebrity. You could pick- Denzel Washington, Al Pacino, and we could find hunters and hunters and hunters for tens and twenties and thirties of thousands. Yeah. So it, unless somebody's got a fucking uh, brute force pen, right, to sign contracts, right. Right, 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 I don't see how that's possible. Oh, I want that one. A little eight bit Jordan Duncan. So and real that quick, is real cool. quick, looking at that, right? See in the bottom here. Yeah. Zero point zero three. Yes. What is what is that? That's the current price in Ethereum. Ethereum is the currency that's used to buy these NFTs. So it's 0. 0.3, 0.03 Ethereum to buy that. Do we know what that equates to? In- uh, right now, Ethereum, I haven't looked today, but it's probably somewhere around two grand per per Ethereum. Wow. Okay, so right there it tells you that if Michael Jordan approved that, that would be a hell of a lot more than two grand, right? That's yeah, true. yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah you so, got me. And now we just saw how many? I mean, it's not the, the point that time. I got you. No, it, no, no, yeah, no, no. Like that. It's just this is where... I'm like, this is just ridiculous. Well, you could police it, can't you? I don't think yet. Yeah, no. Think there's any. How are you going to police it? Yeah, that, on one, blockchain. that one's can't got me. It it's, it's on the blockchain. But how yeah, you going to. Backtrack when they figure it out. Well, you would, know who, you would know that somebody purchased it, purchased it, right? But you wouldn't know who it is. But how does YouTube give people copyright? Is that the same thing? You copyright They'll strikes. figure it out in the system. Yeah, they figure They'll it out. They'll upgrade the, the code and then they go after everybody. Yeah, and they, hey, you can't now. own this. Sorry, you paid for it. Well, yeah, but right now, but I'm now saying, they're making right money. now it's open. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, it's open. It's called open sea. It's open season. That's right, and my and open sea. It, it was a leading <laughs> question to yeah. my my lead in was no. Well, your you, suspicions seem correct. Right. When do you think seem, everybody it, gets fucked and this NFT goes to shit? Well, that's what's going to happen. Is you know, ninety nine percent of them that are out there, they're going to go to zero. They're not going to another work. year because then, again, the the collectability phase is is essentially over. Now, if you're releasing an NFT, there has to be some utility to it, whether it's allowing your community access to behind the scenes content, maybe a bonus content. You mentioned um, Patreon earlier in the conversation. Uh, it, similarly to Patreon, you know, if you buy my NFT, you get access to all of our extra episodes or uncut episodes or whatever it may be. That type of utility or any type of utility is going to be essential going forward. It, but you still have to keep the collectability in mind too, because people still like the pretties. It's you know, they still like, like the shinies. It's almost like the big guys have just sat back. NFTs come about like big guys. I'm talking about. Let's talk about NBA franchises, teams, uh, Fox News networks. They've sat back and they're like, "Oh, damn, cool! It's kind of cool. It's kicking off. All right, we'll make some money now. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have this NFT." And you were going to give you a free season of this. And everybody's like, yeah, fuck yeah. So now they're making bank. These play- oh, man. Just off the, yeah. I mean, they can just well, see, and what's cool, like, though, oh. too, is once you mint it, you always get royalties over the uh, after the sale. Yeah. So if you're the first person to own that NFT, however many times it gets sold, you All continue right. to get royalties off of the sale of the NFT. So it, 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 back in the day, if you had collectibles, you didn't get any royalties off of uh, when it was sold. You know, if you were the first one to sell it, you got the value off of whatever it is that you sold it for. But if it went up in value, you didn't get any cut of that. So if now if somebody sells an NFT and it, for whatever reason, increases in value, you get residuals off of that. So Sorry, well, I know we're down this NFT uh, trend. Now, now we've <laughs> gone down a hole here. If you create your NFT, right? Yep. Okay. And whatever it is, let's, I'm just going to say you have a red hat and devil horns. Whatever. Out, yeah. Right? <laughs> we, lo- we like Great. that. I guess we need Great. that one. That Great. one. Basically, at least you didn't say two dicks out here. Right? So, Mr. Well, Beast, I appreciate Mr. that. Mr. Beast made one with two dicks. I have uh, not seen his, Robert but that Nero. doesn't So that's me. That's, 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 that's out there. You create it's cool. However, 3D, whatever we do to it, I don't know. Splash some stuff on it. Yeah. And you put it up on, is it OpenSea? OpenSea, yeah. OpenSea, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
do you set the price? Like, do you say, I'm going to try to get, I'm not going to go buy Ethereum. I'm going to say $10,000 for this. This is amazing. My artwork is amazing. Yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna, and the, but it, it would translate to Ethereum. But yes, you set the price. And then, of course, like if somebody buys it, so they'll pay the 10, 10 grand. Yep. I'm going to use cash, like money. So 10 grand for it. The equivalent of 10 grand in yep, Ethereum. In sure. Ethereum. And then they sell it. And let's say it's gone up now to $30,000. You're still getting residuals off of that? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's in perpetuity. But would you recommend, and Chris, would you recommend anyone that is looking to invest like that and get the residuals to buy from the actual person? Because, like, I've noticed a lot of people, celebrities, coming out with their own NFTs, and I would assume right. because of shit that we just saw. Right. So it would be better to buy directly from the person if they have one, because when these guys get popped and there's the copyright, it's the inevitable, out, sure. Then there's no residuals, and you lost your ass. If it goes to that, I mean that that hasn't even been forecast as happening as of yet. But I can definitely see where I mean we've seen it in a variety of different industries over the years. It eventually happens. So I would imagine that that would be the case. But I okay, Larry, I, I can't speak to speculation. Right, they're copying right Chris's wife over one. Uh, meditation podcast. Right. You right. got Alan Iverson, Michael right. Jordan, right. Kobe Bryant, right. Al Pacino, and you think maybe? <laughs> I'm done talking out my ass. I'm going to say maybe. <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> business. Yeah. B business. No, no I'm, I'm with you. No, I'm with you 100%. I'm with you 100%. So where do you see podcast in one year from now, 2023, what's it look like? What's the atmosphere one, look like? One year from now, I see there being more integration into Web3, and I see there being more integration into the NFT space. Uh, there's just an opportunity there for community growth that doesn't really exist outside of that space. And I mean, that's what we're, we're seeing everybody migrate that direction. So if your podcasting is going to evolve and you're going to evolve with where the trends are going and the technology is going, you have to go that direction. So uh, hopefully we're going to see more people migrating that direction and we're going to see more integration with podcasting uh, in the Web3 space. All right. Last two questions and then we'll hit the Instagram. But we won't go down the rabbit hole, I promise. <laughs> but, but both, but we got to ask, we got these guys here, we got to ask. I still don't understand this one at all. Okay. I'll start with Chris. Okay. Okay. Can you simply, in a paragraph, tell me what the fuck Web3 is? I'm going to let uh, Larry. I'm going to let Chris. I'm going to let Chris. I'm going to let Chris say that. Pass it around. Pass it around. He asked you, Chris. He asked you. So go ahead. <laughs> Web3 is the decentralized blockchain, which is the next evolution of the web. That is all supposedly decentralized. Will there be a Web 4? I mean, you know, you you and I have seen a lot of these updates. Like, I remember when Google had Panda Update, Ping, like all these things. There's always a Web... It might not be called a Web 4, but it's going to be called something, right? So right now, the term that everybody chose is Web 3. That's what we're calling the decentralized uh, internet, the blockchain. And why do we need it? Because all the centralization has killed everybody, like almost literally and physically, because no one could say anything anymore. Everybody's afraid and everybody's getting shut down. So we need this to open up commerce, freedom and competition. But just like anything, corruption always finds a way to, to get control. So that's why you'll need the Web 4. So. But why and why do they call it like why Web 1? Web two, Web three. Why not? I don't, I don't know the reason for Web three. I'll let Larry. I don't know if you know. Well, why. Web one was the the, off, not right. so not not so public web that yeah. was that existed back then. Web two was more of what we what we grew up with, or I, AOL, I think we grew up with. AOL. Yeah, it was Dial, AOL. That's where, yeah, box, where it was. Yeah. It had you, everybody had access to the internet in some form or fashion. So that was Web two. How about the dumbest move ever? Well, the two dumbest moves ever: AOL Instant Messenger selling itself to what? What uh, Time Warner? And then fucking MySpace selling itself to Fox. Oh, Fox. yeah, dude. MySpace was the biggest. My, MySpace. Was there, the I don't biggest. think there would be a Facebook if MySpace didn't sell. I, I would I would love to know the difference. I would love to know if- I'll tell you if the it, difference. I, when I was a teenager, the girls I got off of MySpace- Oh, dude, I know. MySpace oh, was the spot, dude. God. And like it was- music, uh, music, You could do so much cooler shit with your profile on yeah. MySpace, too, with all music the gifts and, and music in the background and sparkles oh. and shit. You could really make your page stand out. It was, it was, it was awesome. My space. Uh, yes. You know the question I had the other day? Does What's anyone that? knows when I Googled it, I looked it up, I can't do it. I want to try to get back into my MySpace because it's still there, technically. <laughs> and That's it was a, co it was my college um, email address. Well, that, of course, does not exist anymore. 
there, man. Yeah. NFT everybody's uh, old MySpace and sell really? back. Oh, dude, that'd really? be amazing. And be like, hey, look what I have of you, yeah, pal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks college days, too. Hey, man. you put it off at the IN. This is easy shit for you. <laughs> <laughs> I also got shut down for 10 years from PayPal, so I, I, I tend to tread a little lighter Just these days. Just use one that you don't care now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Bitcoin. No. <laughs> uh, it, anyway, that, that is an actually a really cool idea, and I'm probably going to put a little time into seeing if I can make that happen. It is. It because is that idea. would be amazing to see the pictures over there. I've tried. I'm like, I don't know how to get... I mean, I Googled things. I went on YouTube and looked for forum, you know, or, or for videos, looked on forums, and people were like, type in, I think it was like, type in your, you know, your old username which was like whatever at temple.edu it was a college yeah thing and then you know forgot my password well it's going to send it to that email, that email that does not exist it's wiped it's gone. well what's it's cool is i think i still use the same email address that i had because i still have a hotmail address and i'm wondering if i didn't i, I think i've had it that long so hey remember all those guys that you didn't like when you were growing up right, uh, right. Gotta, there's got to be a bad picture in there that there, there their has current to be girl doesn't know about there has or something. to be there and, has and to be and then you look them up on facebook I mean, and say hey on, buddy come on, come on that's what just, i got let's just see let's I just think see. I, yeah, I, the myspace thing is interesting this has got me all all worked up here how big was myspace uh, like i, I mean i, I understand how 300 million users wow at that time i huh? think so and what's Facebook have right now, roughly over a billion? I think it's one. Uh, yeah, but for that time period, it would probably it, would, it was the only thing. It would, yeah, it was just all these kids, like you said in college, everybody was learning coding. They were, they were copy and pasting HTML. Maybe that's how you started learning code. You Maybe know? that yeah. was one of the ways. That, that's what that's how every that literally. was the on ramp. Because I remember friends like, how'd you learn? He goes, yeah, oh, I want my music on here. Everybody's got their music. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. And I mean, all, all the girls would come see your pages, right. and oh, that's oh, and yeah. guys that didn't know how to code. Next thing you know. Yeah, they were coding. A hundred percent. Yeah, right. I used to build websites and I learned HTML initially. I can't off tell of you MySpace. how many of my friends were dumb as rocks. They were coding and I'm like, "What are you doing?" And like, Dude, oh, I yeah. took that stupid. Remember they would have that class on the radio where you could be uh, what that Microsoft certified or some MCSE, shit. MCSE, yeah. Yeah, MCSE. Yeah. yeah, I actually took that shit. My brother took it. Yeah, I failed. Yeah, I failed. It. Yeah. I failed <laughs> it. Actually, I just quit. I went two weeks for this. I can't see you failing. You just didn't play. <laughs> Did you get on there, Larry? Uh, it won't let me sign in. I hit the sign in button and it, it won't load. So I'm not. I don't know what the hell. You know, I was in L.A. earlier this year uh, speaking at a conference, and I was a little nervous for the, you know, the whole Crips and Bloods thing. I was like, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I we might were, change. I might have, like, yeah. dimmed the red for we, that we one. We were driving through Crenshaw. I was like, shit, man. I'm uh, going to die. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Crenshaw, stay away from Yeah, uh, yeah. It ain't red. It's orange. Uh, You're colorblind, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, go back to uh, his website. We'll go through that again. Not the podcast one, the other one. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. readilyrandom.com is the website, but uh, I've got to redirect for Podcast Boost because, again, Podcast Boost is the brand. Uh, and, and it's easier for people to remember Podcast Boost instead of Readily Random. It's so interesting to hear how hard it is for people to say that. You don't think that Readily Random is a tongue twister, but it's it's a, it got embarrassing readily. to say it because I'd go, they go, what's your email? I go, Larry at Readily Random. Readily. They go, readily, what? Readily, how do you spell that? I'm like you don't fucking know how to spell readily. I mean, it's 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 that a simple a weird word though, readily. Uh, yeah, readily. and then follow it up with random, and it, it just it just fucks. Whatever people you up. do, don't ask me how I would spell it. Well, I'm, I probably okay. would do all right. how to A D L Y. What was the other one you earlier? P put a bit of You did all the P's together. Oh yeah, that was really good. Proper previous planning prevents poor podcast performance. Okay, so in closing, explain each one of those that are watching. Well, I, I literally took it. It's, I mean, it's a military term, and I, I got it from. Uh, there's a guy named Richard Marcinko. Uh, he was the founder of SEAL Team Six, and, oh. and yeah, so he was a badass. Hello. And his autobiography is not called. To be with. Not at all. Uh, he just <laughs> pa he passed away this year, oh, but um, his autobiography is called The Rogue Warrior. And uh, I, the first time I ever saw that phrase was uh, in his book, and it was proper previous planning prevents piss poor performance. Jeez. So I just, Perfect. I just ninjaed it, and you know, threw podcast in there instead of piss, and uh, it, it works. So and it resonates. I mean, it's seven P's. That's great. So it turned it into you the, seven P's, the seven P's of podcast. Seven P's. Yeah, yeah, the seven P's of podcasting. You're already so. an author. Yeah. So and I'm working on my second book right now. I do have a book, but I usually don't talk about it because I wrote it really before I should have wrote it. But, you know, it, w this is great for the uh, any kind of upcoming creator. The, the things that you need, you need a course, you need a book, and you need a podcast. And not necessarily in those orders. You know what I mean? So I started the podcast. I heard I needed the other the course and the book. And I wrote the book first. And I, I signed up for a program. Write an Amazon number one bestseller in 30 days. And I did it in 20. 
and it shows in the book. So, but you know, I, I too, I tend to lean back on what I heard Grant Cardone say once because Grant Cardone was talking about his first book, and he gets shit all the time because there's spelling errors and there's grammatical errors, and he says, "Look, man, it's a best-selling book." Not a fucking best written book. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, that's, that's a great point. That, yeah. you know. And, and when I heard Grant Cardone say that, I was like, shit, that's awesome. So I did write my book. Uh, some of it's outdated because it was written four years ago and podcasting has evolved since then. And some of the stuff that I referenced in the book is outdated. But I did write the book. I uh, did the same thing with the course. I have a course called One Plus One Equals Podcast. Uh, it's out there on Udemy. It's a little dated as well. The core information is still great, but it probably could use a little spit and, and, and polish you know, on it. So, uh, But I am writing a book now. It's going to go right along because... I'm on the verge of doing a TEDx talk, and the TEDx talk is going to be yeah, thank you. So that's going to be a, a primary focus there, where I tell more of the story, and uh, it, it's going to be coming out of the shadow of pity porn. Uh, so I, I love that term, and it, it, look, you're it smiling is, yeah. right now. It, it's good, and it always resonates from the stage. So that's going to be the focus of it. That's going to be the TED talk. That's going to be the book, and that's where we're going within the next twelve months. When can we expect the book? Within the next 12 months. Oh, that's a yeah. shitty fucking time. I know. Well, yeah. it's, it, I'm about halfway through it, but I want it to coincide with the TED Talk. And although I'm applying for the TED Talk now, you don't know when you're going to land that thing. And on average, for those that have never given a TED Talk, you have to apply 86 times. What? 86 times before you get it, before someone accepts your talk. Whoa. It's that big? It's that big, and it's that difficult to land. Wow. On average, it's 86 fucking applications before you land that talk. This is going to sound dumb, but why is that so big? Why is this TED Talk thing so big? It's just the reputation that they provide. No, and, I you mean, get it the, in their YouTube channel, you get millions. Yeah. How, how many people will show up at these things? Now, the talks themselves, they vary in size. From It could be tens of people in the audience, 50 to 75 people. It could also go up to several thousand people in the audience. But what you end up as a creator or as a, as a speaker is you end up getting this when it hits YouTube because a lot of people, their careers have been made when their TED Talk hits YouTube and it gets millions and millions and millions of views. So at face value, it's shit. But what it I ends would, up... I, I, or I'm it, Ted, if you're it. listening, I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, they just have a, a massive reputation for bringing quality talks. I mean, there's a ton of guidelines that you have to follow as a speaker. No, I mean, and, I, I mean on the... Like the TED Talk itself right. is, is is shit, but what the TED Talk does for you is massive. Is amazing. Is massive. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there's it's it's just the credibility that comes along with it, and they've gone along. They've they've invested a lot of time and money and resources to become one of the most respected global speaking organizations out there. So if they, if they have, make you apply eighty six times and people do, they've got something. It, right? some, it takes some more. It takes some less. But on average, the average number is eighty six. Well, that's good. They Jesus. they vet. They bet, right? Yeah, so 100%. Have tests, 100%. So. so that's why there's a shitty timeline there because I, I want the two to coincide. So until I land that talk, I can't put a better time frame on it than that. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. So, yeah. Anything else? That's it, man. I just appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's been an amazing conversation. Uh, I've had a ton of fun. I wasn't sure what I was getting into when I showed up, <laughs> but man, you just you, you made it a blast. Right, so we had thank fun. you so much. Had I had a blast. Great job, Chris. Great thank you. Yeah, thank you very I'm much for that. I'm glad I could man. bring two great people together. Oh. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much, Chris. I appreciate it. He had me rolling. Happen. Yeah, uh, all of us, and, and we and we went and we went down and the Rob rabbit hole. Some good points. I'm we went that down MySpace a couple. right there. You got me thinking. I know. Yeah. I know. There's got to be some kind of like. We'll be said, thinking about MySpace all the way home. There's yeah. got to be a MySpace MySpace oh, ID solutions yeah. or something in oh, there. If somewhere. we could break into that, and after and after two and a half hour, and after two and a half hours, the AC is down to seventy three, baby. Hell yeah! I was feeling chilly. I was feeling chilly. Yeah, when we're when we're ending, it's down to seventy three. That's nice. That's nice. God, it was like what eighty felt like in here. That's all right. We're good. That's all right. I wore the hoodie for Florida. I love it. I'm, 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 yeah, that's smart. I, first, I, thought, I, I said, "Thank God you're not from Alaska." <laughs> yeah, yeah, he texted me that earlier. So, sure. yeah, man. Uh, again, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, oh, man. This has been you. awesome. I'd love this to see awesome. you again. Yeah, love to be Great back. Job, thank Tony. you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. All right. 